Welcome to the TT Lock-In. Now, whilst the bikes may not be racing over the mountain this year, we're here to fill in that TT void with eight evenings of exclusive entertainment starting right now with night one of the TT Lock-In fueled by Monster Energy. Today would have marked the start of racing over on the island with the RST Superbike race alongside the three-wheeling media sidecar race one. But never fear, we have plenty of race action coming up for you tonight. Hickman wins again at the Isle of Man TT. Over the next eight nights, we're going to be delving into the archives to check out some of the most famous TT racers in our new series, the Ultimate TT Races, presented by Bennett. You can join in the conversation too via our live web chats with some of the race's top stars. We'll also be showing some of our favorite TT documentaries. And starting tonight is the first ever virtual TT powered by Motel. We've teamed eight gamers with eight TT riders to bring you some TT racing action, albeit in the virtual world. But that's not to say the racing isn't going to be red hot. And don't forget, TT21 is going to be bigger and better than ever. If you're planning a trip next year to the TT, make sure you head to visitisleofman.com. Coming up on tonight's show, we revisit the life and times of one of the greatest TT riders in the David Jeffries story. Jeffries is the winner. Jeffries takes the TT Formula One race. After that, we'll be taking a look at one of the most successful teams in the TT paddock, TAS Racing from Northern Ireland. He's waving at the... I'm sure he's waving at the helicopter I, then. And finally, we'll be kicking off race day number one of the virtual TT powered by Motel. But first, legendary Manxman Milky Quail takes us on an onboard lap of the TT course to show us exactly what it takes to master all 37 and three quarter miles. Richard Milky Quail is going to be the first Manxman since 1967 to win on two wheels here. He's going to be a happy man. Over the moon, I can't believe it, just... My life's ambition. The party lasted for days when he won at the Manx Grand Prix. How long is it going to go on now? He's won a TT race at last. Unfortunately, we've got no TT this year, so uh, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a TT taster and I'll get you a little bit of a TT fix now as an onboard lap around the TT course. This lap that we're going to use today is going to be uh, was Peter Hickman's last year's lap from the Superbike race, first lap. So uh, it shows you the all the tension and stuff and what's going on around you. You can see there on the start line, it's, uh, it's jam-packed. I mean, I've gone through the dead zone there. I'm on the start line. Um, I can't look at it, I'm, I'm just focused on the road. That's all I'm thinking about now is just trying to catch the person who started 10 seconds in front of me. Peter started number 10, I think he was. So uh, we're just looking for the person who's 10 seconds in front, 10 seconds in front, 10 seconds in front. I know if I'm catching people, then I know that I'm, uh, I'm making some good time. So that's. In the rider's mind, that's all we're looking at, is just trying to think, catch the person in front, catch the person in front, trying to get my apexes right, trying to stay relaxed, trying to stay calm. I know it sounds crazy, you're doing 200 miles an hour, and you've got to stay calm and trying to get settled in, but that's the key to the start of your, of your race, is just trying to settle in and not scare yourself straight away. If you scare yourself on the first lap, the job's knackered, you can't, you can't settle in then, you're always a little bit nervous and stuff, whereas just settle in nice and quickly, get on the job, get chasing down, try and relax, hit your apexes, and then uh, it job's a dream, job's a dream then. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go for a quick, uh, quick, fast lap here. It's gonna be fast, gonna be furious. I'm gonna give you a bit of a rider's perspective of what to look for, where to be on the road, where to set the bike up for the jumps and stuff. So yeah, it's pretty full on. Uh, it only goes down pretty well. Everyone generally enjoys it. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's ace, it's the, it's the best thing in the world. And you know, uh, unfortunately we can't do it this year. Nice sunny weather out there as well, but uh, we can't do it, but hey, we'll give it a try, and hopefully this will, like I say, I'll give you a bit of a TT fix, okay? So I'll just uh, try and work out this thing, and then uh, we'll get going. So I'm just looking for the flag man on the right-hand side, the starter. As soon as he drops that flag, I can get away. I don't want to cook the clutch either. Remember, it's an endurance race. I've got six hard laps here, so I don't want to cook the clutch up off the line. I just want to be nice and gentle with it, get the clutch out, get it disengaged as quick as possible, up through the gearbox, uh, and then we go. So here we go. Try not to stall as well. <laughs> That's another thing. You don't want to stall in front of all those people. So let's go. Let's go. There we go. So off the line. Dump the clutch. Up through the gearbox. Here we go. Just up through the gearbox. Up through first, second, third, fourth, fifth. 
just coming through the top of St Ninians now, move over the bike to the left hand side of the road, a little bit of a wheelie as it goes over the top of St Ninians, over to the right, to the top of Bray Hill, back to sixth gear, down Bray Hill here now, big full fuel load, the whole thing just moving around as they're going down through the bottom of Bray Hill, big compression through the bottom, nice big wheelie over Agos, there it goes, lands again, nice little wheelie here as well, so we run down now towards Quarterbridge, now say the White House, there's your breaking point, breaking, got to come back on the throttle for the bump, land hard, breaking hard now, breaking, oh doesn't want to slow down, down through the gearbox, back down, back down, be nice and gentle, be gentle, be gentle, be gentle, nice and gentle, now get the thing upright and get it hard on the gas, drive it on, up through the gearbox now, come on, back up now towards Braddon Bridge, this is the first left hand corner on the circuit, so that left hand side of the tyre is so cold, I don't want to be too aggressive, so just over to the right, be gentle, be gentle, be gentle as I'm tipping it in, tipping it in, transfer over now, over now to Braddon Bridge, now give it on, get it on, get it on, let's go, let's go, let's just turn the volume up a little bit there as well, there we go, let's see about that engine rev, up through the gearbox now, back up through the gearbox, getting up now towards fourth, fifth, up towards sixth gear, just to go through Snowbird Jump here, look at this, it's so fast, oh, completely lovely, big wheelie just there, lands, breaking down for the entrance into Union Mills, watch, watch this left hand as well, front of the tyre as well, still cold on that left hand side, still cold on the right hand side, get back on the throttle, ride the bump just there, there's a bump just there, out towards the pavement, back underneath the filling station, back out to the pavement, elbows in, knees in, toes in, head in, trying to keep as aerodynamic as possible, I'm trying to look in the front now, can I see someone, can I see someone, no I can't see anybody just yet, can't see anyone just yet, well hey oh, come on, let's go through towards the top of Balacry. here we go, here we go, up towards Balagheri, here we go, it's Balagheri, completely fast, really fast, look at that, no, can't see your apex, there it is, back on the throttle again, back now to sixth gear for the run down now towards past Crosby School, okay, so elbows in, knees in, toes in again, I need to breathe here, have a quick look at the temperature gauge, make sure she's not running too hot, okay, I'm doing 200 miles an hour almost here as I'm coming through DJs, look at this, it's so fast, completely flat out, oh, it takes me all week to get that one fast, elbows in, knees in again, looking now past the Crosby pub, in by the telegraph pole, over to the right hand side of the road, here it comes, oh my god, look at this, oh, oh, it's going into outer space, whoa, Jesus, that's horrible, <laughs> I hate that one, okay, so we run down now, almost the fastest part of the circuit just here now, can we run now down into Greenberg Castle, okay, see the White House, there's my breaking point, down a gear, back in now onto these three lefts, over now to the mirror, breaking hard, back down another gear, back over now, hard transfer over, hard transfer, but be gentle, be gentle, get the thing upright, and now squared it on, short shift it now for the run down, up towards Appledean, over towards the pavement, over to the walls of wall, off the throttle, climb over the bike, back on the throttle again, out to the two dogs, back underneath into the pavement, back out to the telegraph pole, and we run now in towards Greenberg Bridge itself, breaking hard now, back down a gear, late apex, there we go, back on the throttle, watch the bump, oh, there we go, back up through the gearbox, Come on, back to sixth gear as quick as I come now towards Gorsley. This is super fast right hand bend. Look at this. It's so, so fast through into here. Out over towards the wall, back underneath the pavement, back out towards the wall again. Oh, takes me again all week to get that one fast. Come on, running down now in towards, in towards um, Balacrain. Jeez, I forgot there. Okay, but into Balacrain, break it hard. Down for the gearbox, knee over towards the hedge back on the throttle, driving on, okay now, so look out, it's getting dark and dank under here, it's a perfect TT day today, it's not too sunny, not too hot, but it's all good, okay, back into Ballaspur, I've crashed there, that's not a good one for me, that one, back out now towards the left hand side, towards Blake Bridge and Doran's Bend, so a Blake Bridge down a gear, into Doran's Bend itself, bumpy here, really bumpy, the whole bike moves around, hard on the throttle, driving it out through, up towards this one here, and it's all Laurel Bank, watch this one, don't go in early, don't go in early, now come in, now come in, there we go, knee to the kerb, Oh, quick hard transfer over, back out to the pavement again, back over to the actual Laurel Bank itself, early apex into there, knee on the kerb, driving it back hard, look I can see someone in front of me, I caught someone already, get in there, I know I'm going doing some good time here now, threw in down towards the black dub, a little bit of a wheelie just there, over towards this late apex, go in late, go in late, there we go, hard transfer over underneath the wall, get the thing upright, get the thing upright and now drive it on, whole thing's moving around from run to this one here, I call this mini Daytona, this one's super fast, this one's super slow, breaking, slow it down, late apex into that one as well, driving it through, in towards the wall, breaking hard, there we go, just wait, just wait, just wait, get in now, watch this one here, negative camber, dead easy to crash on that exit, and then watch this one here, it's negative camber as well, dead easy to fall the front just there, oh, I can crash dead easy just there, so be gentle, feel what the bike's doing underneath you, up towards Lamfell here now, up towards Cronkavody, in, out, in, and out again now, be nice and gentle, just trying to keep the throttle on as hard as I possibly can, driving up over now, up towards Cronkavody, elbows in, knees in, toes in, just getting sixth gear before this big wheelie just here, a little bit of a wheelie just there, we run down Crunk of Body straight, okay look come here, here he comes, I'm going to catch him, he's going to start holding me up now, where can I get through past him, into the end of Crunk of Body, my god that's fast, whoa, a little bit of a wheelie just there, lands over, the, a little bit of a wheelie just there as well, into the run now, into the 11th milestone, who is it, who is it, 
Okay, on the end of the curb. Look, he's starting to block me now. I can't see through. I can't see through. Where can I go? Where can I pass him? We're going to pass the left or the right. Let's go. Let's go on the inside of him. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, 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 no. I can't. This bike's too fast. Breaking, breaking. Over to the right now. Back under now. Come on, into Grieber. Into Hanley's. Come on, come on. Get going, get going. Come on, come on. Oh, come on. I'm coming out. Come down to the. Get underneath. Where can I pass him? Where can I pass him? I can't see. Look, it's really hard to see when, they, when you're stuck behind someone. Look, let's go get a clear view into the top of Big Arrow. Yes, come on. I'm going to get him here. Oh, no, I can't. That bike's so fast. That Honda's so fast. Over to the right. Drive it in now. Get hold on the power now. Just try and get it past him now for the bottom of Big Arrow. Yes, I've got him now. There we go. Into towards the bottom of Big Arrow. Look at this, though. It's a complete bump here. Oh, straight through. The whole thing tank slaps. Others are coming down the exit. Really bumpy just here. We run down now towards the 13th milestone. It's late apex. Don't want to go in early. I must stay out. Stay out. Stay out. Stay out. Stay out. Now I'm in. Now I'm in. Into there. There's your apex. Pick the bike up. Over towards the pavement. And then again, this one's a late one again. Don't go in. Don't go in. Now go in. There we go. There's my apex. Beautiful on the exit through the 13th milestone through Westwood. Down towards Kurt Michael now into Douglas Road Corner. Okay, a little bit of a wheelie. Breaks into the village. There's a crossroads. So there's your breaking point. Down some gears, couple of gears into here, bumpy, back in the throttle, drive it on, drive it on, come on through in Kurt Michael, I love Kurt Michael, it's beautiful, look at it, up through the gearbox now, back up to fourth, fifth, sixth gears, I'm coming down through, a little bit of a wheelie here now at Slukern, over to the right hand side of the road, looking for the exit out of the bridge, white, yellow line, yellow line, yellow line, that's the hard one, that turn there, okay now into Renko and look at this one, oh my god, down a gear, back in the throttle, over, lands, patters like hell, into the hedge, Pull over the bike, get over the bike, turn, pull up right, jump on the throttle now. Whoa, that was so technically hard. Back up for the gearbox now, back to sixth gear, through towards Bishop's Court. A little bit of a wheelie for me run through this. Watch this Bishop's Court, left, right flick. Look at this, it's super fast, completely 200 miles an hour. Left, right, the whole bike moves around now on the exit as I'm coming out through in towards Alpine. Iceman's there, he curb, hedge, curb. Now into Alpine. Here we go, a little bit of a little bump there, down a the gear. Back in the throttle, early apex, drive it out, drive it out now, in towards, down in towards, Kurt, like, in, into Balaf, okay? So here we go, so this is a super fast one here, Balakob, look at this, completely flat out into Balakob, breaking out 30 mile an hour signs, oh shit, oh, oh, come on, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, let the brakes off, get the thing upright, oh, over the jump, back in the throttle again, come on, back up for the gearbox, the bike feels slow, come on, let's build it back, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth gear, as quick as it can come, through now towards this one here. This one is going to make you cry. It's called Bala Cry, okay? Look at this. It's fearsomely fast. Flat and sixth gear. Look at that. And there's a big jump just here. Whoa! That's the biggest, hardest jump on the circuit, that one. Okay, so we're coming now down towards Wildlife Park or Quarry Bends. Look at this. We've got a right, a left, a right, a left, and a right. It's so technically hard. Down a gear. Into the right. Ugh. Out over to the white line. Pull it back over to the right. Ugh. Get the bike to turn again. Ugh. Get the bike to turn again. Ugh. Get the bike to turn again. Oh, just for the last one. Oh my God, that takes it out of you. It's trying to get the super bike that's such a big heavy lump, but turtles want to turn at speed. Okay, back to sixth gear. Elbows in, knees and toes and head in. Look in the distance. Can I see anyone? Come on. Where are they? Where are they? Come on. Come on. Trying to keep his aerodynamic. 200, 205, 210 miles an hour here through this fastest part of the circuit here almost. Just through there. Look at that. Completely flat out on a super bike. As soon as I see the bridge, I'm breaking. Back down for the gearbox. Look, I'm catching somebody. Get in there. Breaking, coming down for the gearbox, but the trouble is I'm caught now at Sulby Bridge. I'm thinking, oh no, he's going to hold me up now all the way run into the technical bit into Ramsey. Over towards Ginger Hall, over to the right, underneath the telegraph pole, out to the first 50 mile hour sign, back under the hedge, get the bike upright, a little bit of a wheelie, down now and towards Kerrimore. So, so bumpy here, super bumpy. Let off the brakes now, get control of the bike, back on the throttle again, but be gentle, don't give it too much revs. Be gentle, just ride the bumps, ride the bumps, ride the bumps, get over the jump and now give it it. Come on, let's go. Back up now, fourth. Fifth, sixth gear, we're going to run through now towards Glen Tram. And look at this, look how fast this is. It's just from one side of the road to the other side of the road. It's dark, it's dank, you're completely flat out. The thing's tank slapping as it's, it's hot out as the way through here now. If we run now down towards Glen Tram itself. Okay, so I'm just coming down through the gearbox, just down a couple of gears there, over to the right, back down another gear, climb over the bike, and then back on the throttle and drive it out. Come on, let's go, let's go. Back to fourth, fifth, sixth gear, as quick as I can through now towards the conquer trees and the K tree. Okay, so curb, hedge, curb, and then keep the bike upright, a little bit of a wheelie, over to the right, now into the bottom of Sky Hill, bumpiest corner on the whole circuit, just here, down one gear, it's so bumpy, bum, 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 bum. over to the right, climb over the bike, look, it's tank slapping, bum, 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 bum. again, it goes nice and smooth, back on the throttle again now to drive, pick it up through Milltown Cottage, bumpy here, tank slaps a little bit, and we run now in towards Ramsey itself, over Milltown Bridge, underneath the wall, look, it's Michael Rutter, get in there, I've got a good drive on him, under the inside of him, oh, his bike's fast, though, BMW's still fast again, like mine, breaking now. 
into Schoolhouse Corner. A couple of gears, back on the throttle, drive it through. There we go, from run now down in towards Parliament Square. There's my braking point just there at the crossroads. It's been resurfaced recently, so it's nice and smooth now. Off the brakes and back on the throttle. Be gentle, don't be aggressive. It's very easy to high side just there. So just be nice and cool and calm. Back up for the gearbox, back up to third. Underneath the bridge, revving it out, off the throttle. Bumpy, but it used to be bumpy, but look, it's nice and smooth now. Been resurfaced last year. Really nice, beautiful. Back up for the gearbox, in towards Stella Maris, this one here, in towards Stella Maris. There we go, look at that. Into White Gates, and then this is Stella Maris just here. Into here, look at that beautiful corner, beautiful, beautiful corner. Now into Ramsey Hairpin, breaking now into Ramsey Hairpin. This is horrible, so slow. You've been going so fast for so long, it feels like you're gonna fall off just as you come through here. Okay, so just get the thing turned upright and back on the throttle. Back up for the gearbox, second, third gear. Be nice and gentle, it's dank and dark under the trees. Bit slippy over the white line as well. Be careful, into the waterworks. Slow down a little bit for the first one. Slow down a lot for this one. You've got to take all your speed off for this one. Second gear, be gentle, be gentle. Get the thing back on the throttle now. Back up through and towards Tower Bends. Look at this, it's beautiful. Right, left, bumpy here. There's a bump there, there and there. It's in the exit for your run up now towards the gooseneck. Okay, underneath the wall on the left, underneath the wall on the right, braking, down a gear, climb over the bike, back on the throttle, just quick squirt. Up now, up towards the gooseneck. Back down, but be gentle, be careful, be careful, be careful. Upright, now drive it on. Dead easy the high side there as well if you're too aggressive. Back up for the gearbox now. Come on, look for these two fast lefts. First one's lovely, not a problem. Second one's a little bit harder, over towards the tree. Look at that, it's real fast underneath there. Pushes you right out towards the pavement on the, on the right-hand side of the road. In towards Joey's, little transfer, off the throttle, back of the throttle again, bumpy on the exit. Oh, 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 up towards Guthrie's, look at this. Oh no, well, Guthrie's is horrible, look, you're fat, flat as fast as you can here. It's coming at you, it's coming at you, it's coming at you. Oh, into number one, there's the one you want. Into number two, into number three, and there's your breaking point now. Back over now into Guffrey's itself. Be gentle here, don't crash here. Look, don't be gentle, be gentle, be gentle. Get on the throttle now, over to the right, over to the right. And get, again, this one here. Get back on the throttle now. A little bit of a wheelie just there. A little bit of a wheelie. If we run through the snotty bridge, just tuck your shoulder in. Through now, past Gary Johnson there. There we go, lovely. If we run up now towards a mountain mile. Elbows and knees and toes in. I must be going well, because I'm catching plenty of people. So I'm going good. Okay, so I'm just sat there, looking the distance. Come on, come on, let's get to the top of the mountain mile, just sat there, listen to that bike sing, flat out in sixth gear, there's no one in the world who can do it, it's amazing, look at it, oh, look at that, listen to that, okay, for so the bridge at the end of the mile, that's a problem, that's a little snotty one, just this one here, that there's negative camber, it's really fast through there, breaking up the bridge, back down in the mountain box, okay, so down a couple of gears, over to the right, back to the white line, back in the throttle again, driving it on, driving it back on, back up to fourth, fifth, sixth gear again, for me run up now, over towards the bottom of Snay Hill and towards the Black Hawk, okay? So before that, we've got George's Folly, this little snotty one just here, or Casey's. Look at this, you've just got to roll it. Back in the throttle again. Oh, there's John. John's got a problem, obviously. If we run now into the Black Hawk, okay? So look at the Black Hawk, bumpy there on the, on, the way, on the way through. Driving it through on towards the veranda. Four bends, but it's number three that I'm looking for. There's number one. There's number two. Here's number three, that's the one to go for. Into number three. Out then to the white line. Back into number four. Back out on the exit. If we run down now in towards Graham's Memorial. This one's a bugger, I've trashed at this one as well, okay? So look, it sucks you in. You want to come in too early, but just wait, just wait. Apex at the end of the wall, and now back out now, driving out. I crashed, I broke both my toes on that one. That was really sore, that one. Okay, so out over to the left-hand side of the road. Entrance now in towards the white rocks. Breaking now, get the thing slowed off. Back on the throttle now for the bungalow itself. Driving on hard now. Get it over the hilly lines. Driving it really hard on, up the exit, up towards Brandywell, the highest point on the whole circuit, okay? so. This, as soon as we get to the top of here, we're going to drop down towards the grandstand, okay? So up to the top, top highest point in the circuit. I've also crashed at this one as well, so... But this one was a bit more than broken uh, feet, it was broken legs in this one and all sorts, but... Hey -oh, back on the throttle, here we go, back up for the gearbox, back to fourth, back to fifth, back to sixth gear. Just a quick sixth, if we run now to a 30 second milestone, slow down for the first two. Just slow down for the first one, and now back on now, to number two. Back on the throttle now, over to the white line, back into number three. Running down now towards Windy Corner. Breaking up the little hump just there, but watch this one, don't go in early, just wait, just wait. Now go back on the throttle, drive it on. Out towards the white line on the exit, back up through the gearbox, back to fifth, back to sixth gear, as quick as I can, run down now towards the 33rd milestone. Again, this one's super, super fast. Look at how fast this is. Big sweep and right-left combo. Okay, so over to the left, open the corner up, back into the hedge, transfer over the bike, and back on the throttle again. <coughs> Out to the white, across the white line, back over to the bollards, back on the again then. Down towards Keppel, okay, down towards Keppel, breaking now at the first sign. Drag the bike over to the right, climb over the bike again. Back on the throttle, out towards the pavement on the right-hand side of the road. 
back up for the gearbox, running down towards Kate's Cottage. There we go, just off the throttle, back on it again. So we run down now towards the Craig. A little bit of a wheelie just here. There we go, so we run down now towards the Craig. Don't cock the braking up on this, so make sure you brake nice and early. There we go, between three and two. Back down, hard on the brakes, just slowing it back down, off the brakes, and back of the throttle, drive it on, on the exit. Elbows in, knees in, toes in, head in. Now we're going down to the fastest part of the circuit. Here we go. Going to be 205, 210 miles now on the big modern superbikes now. It's sensational. Look how fast this is. Look at that. Oh, yeah. That's what we want. We want some speed. Okay, so we're running down now to Brandish. I call this the Carlsberg corner. If Carlsberg main TT corners, that's the corner. Look at it. It's beautiful. Fifth gear, late apex. Oh, it doesn't get any better than that, folks. Okay, so we're running down from that one now down to this one here. This one's horrible. Here we go. Look at this. Narrow, dark, dank, light apex, bumpy, oh, oh, nightmare. Okay, for running up now and towards Cronk Namona, over towards the Matrix sign, open the corner up, don't go in early, don't go in early, out towards the cross hatching and back into number two, that's the one you want. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. And coming now, breaking down towards the signpost corner, the thing wants to come round on you, breaking, 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 let off the brakes, get it straight and back on the throttle and drive it out. Up towards Bedstead now, just watch this one, don't go in early again, don't go in early. There's the apex, there we go, back on the throttle, drive out towards the pavement, if we run down towards the nook, Braking again, don't go in here too hot, just break it nice and gentle into the, in the white line and drive it on. There we go, look how dark and dank it is under here as well. Break it at the end of the shell grip, break it hard, watch the bump, whole thing moves around. Be careful now into this one here, into Governor's Bridge. The slowest part of the circuit, very easy to crash, very, very easy. Just be gentle, be gentle, be gentle, but still be gentle, still be gentle. Just wait, just wait, just wait, get the thing upright and now give it. Come on, let's go, let's go. Back up for the gearbox. Second, third, fourth, fifth. Sixth gear, as I'm going over the start and finish line now, doing about 170, 175 miles an hour for another five laps. So, yeah, so that was pretty full on, folks. A little bit of sweat on there, <laughs> out of breath. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty fast, hard lap, that is. So, um, yeah, obviously, Peter's a, the top man. He's the man at the moment. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'd have seen him and Dino having a good fight this year, but uh, we're not going to see that now, are we? So maybe next year. Absolutely unbelievable. And that wasn't a one-off from Milky Quail. He is always like that when he takes anybody on a lap of the TT course. Now, from one TT legend to another, and this one I'm going to put on a slightly higher pedestal, and I'm sure Milky won't mind me doing that. He is, after all, nine times a TT winner. One of the greatest ever TT riders is, of course, the David Jeffries story. <laughs> Racing's always been in the family. I mean, it started with uh, my grandpa. He used to ride first Scott motorcycles in Shiplu, which was near the shop. And then uh, my father started racing. He did. He rode for Triumph, and he raced in the, the short circuits, the Grand Prix, and the TT. Then my uncle, he started racing. He's ridden for. He's ridden factory Hondas, factory Yamahas, and then progressed down to me. You could tell straight away that David had the natural ability at the Alaman, and you know I had a good result. David had a good result, and we were all pumped for next year. And I think. I think next year he didn't do it in 97 because I think he just uh, smashed his collarbone at uh, Donington on a BMW and I think he uh, wrote one of his father's BMWs off as well. <laughs> Fully recovered from his injuries, Dave was back at the TT in 1998. No Honda this time though, now he was racing the new R1. The secret to going well at the TT is knowing the circuit. Now, I mean, I've, done, I've, I've been quite fortunate this, this week, even with losing the, the Wednesday practice, I've got quite a few laps in, but... I still sort of don't really know where I'm going enough yet to sort of start winning races. I mean, like I say, it is only my second time here. I missed last year because I had a, an accident at a, a track day a week before the TT, which was a bit unfortunate. So I, yeah, I wasn't fit to ride, I broke my collarbone. But I'm really enjoying myself, I'm learning my way around, and I mean, I, I enjoy riding the production bike. You know, it doesn't do anything silly, it handles really well. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to go out and enjoy myself and see how we do. And the boy done good, even though this was only his second time at the TT. Eighth places in both the Formula One and Junior races were backed up by a fourth position in the production TT. Then came a quick glance at the winner's enclosure 
and thought of what might have been. I knew he'd done the TT in 98 and I was looking for a, a good rider uh, to put on board the, the, the Yamaha R1s that year because I, I knew that we had a chance of, uh, of beating the Hondas. And so began the relationship between Dave Jeffries and the VNM racing team. And this is David Jeffries. David Jeffries has never won on this Northwest 200 course. He's been trying since 1994, and he surely is well on his way to his first ever win. David won all the races he was entered, including the 600. Um, I think he even got new lap records that year, if I remember rightly. And I remember him saying to his father, um, I think they were on the phone, and I, and I could remember him saying, I could just hear him saying, oh, I could eat my dinner off it down the straights. His father must have said, how's it handling? I could lift my hand off the straights, it's straight as a die, you know, so we knew if it handled around there at those speeds, it's going to be good at the TT. And we also knew that he'd raced a previous model the year before, and he could, you know, he was used to that particular bike anyway, so we just give him the horsepower and, um, you know, a little bit better chassis package, and we knew we could, we could win the TT. This is David Jeffries. He is Ian Duffers, his teammate Jeffries. Absolutely in great form. The Northwest 200 winner. Oh, look at this. 15. That is David Jeffries. He qualified in third place. Locker at the bungalow. 31 miles out. David Jeffries in fourth place behind Locker. He's now running down towards Parliament Square. Ian Duffus, he's in second place after lap one. At the end of lap two, Joey was leading this race, but that pit stop will have cost him. So at the end of lap two, Joey led from David Jeffries, from James Courtney in third place. Duffus was in fourth place. Oh, Balaf Bridge. Joey Dunlop is just absolutely superb through there. David Jeffries, hard on his heels though. Uncle Nick has won a TT back in 93. Dad Tony's a famous TT rider as well. This is David Jeffries up May Hill then towards the Ramsey hairpin. It's only four laps, this TT Formula One race. That is David Jeffries on his run up towards Guthrie's. He's now going up and over the mountain. At the end of lap three, he leads from Joey Dunlop, James Courtney, Ian Duffus and Ian Locker. This is Joey Dunlop in second place. Can he make it back? Not enough time, possibly. Craig Navarre. Jeffries has got this absolutely all right. Well, what a race this is going to be for Jeffries. He doesn't think he knows this course that well. It looks a bad to me. Pin down on Jeffries, leading this race on the VNM Yamaha. Well, Honda have won this race for the last 17 years. VNM were part of Honda last year, not this year. They're running Yamahas. David Jeffries, he led at the end of lap three. Has Joey Dunlop managed to make it back on the Honda RC45? Oh, David Jeffries there making a few casual adjustments as he runs on down through Craig Navarre. <laughs> Very casually indeed. Joey comes in, number 12, over the line. Joey takes a checker flag. Now we've got to wait and see where Jeffries is as he comes to Governor's Bridge into the dip. This is David Jeffries. This is the man all eyes and ears are listening and looking for out of Governors, onto the Glen Cluttery Road. The times is ticking, the time is ticking. Joey Dunlop did an all-time best of 18 minutes, 23.7 seconds, 123.06 miles an hour at the end of his last lap. What has Jeffries got for him? Jeffries is the winner. Jeffries takes the TT Formula One race. Joey Dunlop is beaten back into second place despite a personal best time. And that is David Jeffries' first ever win here. Brilliant. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I, I didn't think I'd got enough spe experience to win here, but I mean, like I said, I did the first couple of laps and I saw P2, then when I saw P1, I just thought, right, let's really try and go for it. So just to really keep in front and just unbelievable. It's amazing. The 99 Formula One race was his first ever TT win. Next in line, the production TT. Four, David Jeffries. Can he add the production TT to his Formula One win already? Well, three laps will tell. Under St Ninian's traffic lights and down Bray Hill now to the bottom of Bray Hill. Compression of the suspension just there and then back up the other side and onto Quarter Bridge. What a picture that is of Jeffries at speed. Oh, look at this. Well, Duffus has caught and passed number four, David Jeffries. So Duffus really is flying. David Jeffries is second in this race at the moment. 
Into the stop box comes Duffus, the race leader. Now then, he stalled it in the stop box. He's got to run down the bit lane. This is costing him dearly. Well, Duffus, you could have made a mess of this. He and Duffus in all sorts of trouble. Comes into his slot. Good job it wasn't further down pit lane. The VNM boys get the fuel ready. Jeffries pulls in behind Duffus. These two, first and second into pit lane. First and second in the road, and out goes Duffus. Oh, oh, oh dear me, it gets no closer than that as he nearly knocks through the rear end of number 31, John Hepburn. Here's Jeffries. Where's Duffus? Jeffries is at Governors for the last time. He comes to the end of his third lap. Where is Duffus? Duffus is out. Duffus is out. His bike has stopped. That's Bedstead. So a short distance from home on the last lap. Out has gone Ian Duffus. Well, he will not win this TT. Ha, what absolutely terrible luck then for Ian Duffus. Jeffries is going to take the chequered flag and his second TT win of the week. That's fairly special, is that? Because I could say I was plus one, and then going into the last lap at uh, or second lap at Balakur, and he used the same braking mark as the other bike, and just overshot. I just thought, oh, and as Duffus came past me, just thought, oh well, that's it. And I stood him in as because I thought he'd pull away, and I could keep with him. And then I, my fuel light came on, so I had to roll it a little bit all the way over the mountain, and then he must have had a bit of a mess up in the pits or something. I don't know, but I, I was right with him then, and I just thought, last lap, right, let's really, really try, and it worked. That made it two wins so far. And there was still the senior TT to come. David Jeffries, two wins this week already. What a TT he's having to go with the Northwest 200. It's been a superb start to the season for him. Jeffries at the gooseneck in second place at the moment to the flying Jim Moody. Jim Moody has absolutely left the track like a bullet from a gun. Jim Moody then comes to the line and he is absolutely flying. It's a new lap record. Jim Moody, 124.45 miles an hour from a standing start. The senior TT is alive. Number three, David Jeffries. Well, surely it's not going to be win number three with Moody at this kind of pace. The crowd keep an eye on three. Jeffries and drama here at the senior TT. This is your new race leader. The new lap record holder, Jim Moody, has gone out at Balig. And David Jeffries is on course for his third TT win. But at the corner bridge, it is the race leader. David Jeffries then about to catch a back marker. Number 82, Jerome van Hiltert from Belgium. Jeffries wheelies his way past. Well, Jerome, get an eyeful of that. Up towards Braddon. Jeffries sips into the left hand. He looks so casual. I can't believe he's leading this race by the amount of time that he is. Oh, big wheelie time. David Jeffries, he's got so much in hand here. He's decided to show off. Down from Craig Nabar, what a hero. They are going to love him around this track. With just Governor's Dip to negotiate and the Glen Crutchery Road, it is going to be win number three for the 1999 TT hero. David Jeffries has put his mark on the island. I was unbelievably proud when he won his first TT. And I, I remember him coming up, I remember him, you know, I remember the eye contact when we saw him, you know, and obviously, I mean, I mean, <laughs> half the team were in tears. You get very emotional about that, man. Very emotional, and uh, we all sort of, we all, <laughs> everybody ends up crying over everybody else, and uh, somehow you, you, you get through that. But it's, I think your first one—that's the way, the way it happens. And so, for him to win, and then to win again, and then to win again, in in, in one week, just made it, you know. Oh, one of the most momentous occasions of my life, I think. It was it was certainly better than my win. Now, that, that's I think I think that probably qualifies it. Um, having Dave win a TT was better than me win a TT without a shadow of a doubt.
So, two goals for Dave to achieve in 2000. First is assault on the TT, beginning with the Formula One. We look at the uphill section past Crosby. Look out for the pub on the right-hand side. There it is. Oh, look out for David Jeffries. A red and yellow streak went flashing past us. Joey leads it. David Jeffries is two seconds down in second place. His teammate Michael Rutter is a second down on that in third place. John McGuinness here is in third place and David Jeffries has dropped to fourth. He is nine seconds behind Joey Dunlop. There's second place now. Rutter, and it looks as though David Jeffries has had a bit of a moment somewhere or other. Oh, look at David Jeffries. Well, he's got his confidence back, and no mistake. David Jeffries absolutely piling it on now. Glen Helen, it was Dunlop from Rutter by an increased margin. The gap is now two seconds unofficially, so Rutter here has lost a bit of time. So, it was one and a half seconds at Ramsey. And Dunlop lapped in 18.27. Jeffries, 18.22 at the stop box. He's in the lead by half a second. Joey Dunlop flies it across the bridge at a luff. He's something like 17 miles into that lap, and he has grabbed back the lead of this race. And here's the reason why David Jeffries has stopped at Belig Bridge. The BM Yamaha has stopped. David Jeffries has parked it at Belig. That was a sad race for us to lose, really, because, again, that's how, how uh, good a rider David was and how, how professional he was. The start of that race was had been a lot of rain and it was a lot of damp patches and a hell of a lot of leaves of, all under the trees on you know around the Laurel Bank section. Um, same down through Glen Tramon. So what David did, he set off and he just, he wanted to have a look at the circuit. Joy being Joy, uh, it was always Excel in those type of conditions, really turned the wick up and he had a lead on David as he come through the first lap. But once David had had a look at the track and he could see where everything was, he started to turn it up then on the second lap, closed up on Joy and uh, I think the, the guys made a little bit of time up on the pit stop. And uh, unofficially, we was, uh, I think, 1.5, 1.6 seconds in front after Bala Crane. And then a clutch basket broke. A flag for David Jeffries. The first victory of the week then for Jeffries, with Archibald having to settle for second place. I could tell he was pushing me. I could see the gap was, you know, staying between, like, between sort of four and six, seven seconds. So I knew I had to really keep my head down. The last lap, I really tried. I mean, I don't know how quick I went the last lap, but it, uh, I was certainly trying fairly hard. Rain greeted the riders for Friday's production race with the conditions far from ideal. Those eyes tell you a lot about the man behind the mask. This is the Man Mountain himself. This is Big Dave, winner of this event last year. And by the look on his face, he's a man on a mission today. And you can see as the bike snatches that there's no grip there at all. The climb out of Union Mills, wheel spin even now. And Jeffries goes steaming past, he's made up 10 seconds and no mistake. In fact, most people are taking it steadily, except perhaps this man, David Jeffries, leader from Milky Quail by a second at Glen Helen, dominating the bike now as they make the right turn. Jeffries really on it, is eight seconds to the good over Richard Quail coming up out of Ramsey. Jeffries at the end of lap one. Oh, he goes squirrelling past the grandstand at 150 miles an hour. Well, nothing to worry about there. David Jeffries round the Craig for the final time on his way to win the production TT. There's the sign that says P1 and he lifts the front wheel to acknowledge the signboard. David Jeffries, what can you say about this man? Yeah, it was uh, fairly scary that race. I must admit it. Um... The conditions are absolutely horrendous. There's a lot of standing water about. You know, I mean, certain like end of the mountain mile that lap, I was getting wheel spins at you know the speed I was showing 140 mile an hour, and the back wheel still spinning. So it's pretty scary. His second win of TT 2000 
but could he repeat his 1999 feat and make it three wins in a week? The wet conditions meant the postponement of the senior TT until the following day, and the sun was most definitely out 24 hours later as the riders lined up on the start line along the famous Glen Crutchery Road. A beautiful sunny morning here on the Isle of Man. Through the streets goes Jeffries, and we're starting to get the times from around the course. Oh, and lifting the front wheel coming out of Ren Cullen. Well, he really is charging. David Jeffries here had made up nine seconds in the lead over Michael Butter, who is the new second place. Well, we could almost tell that by looking. Prompt the Mona. David Jeffries goes through here and that will light the light in pit lane that tells the crew he is coming and he will be coming in. It's going to be a rear wheel change. The way Jeffries has been caning it, that's hardly a surprise. Fresh Pirelli's on the back end. A lifetime separates David Jeffries from everybody else now. He is 28 seconds to the good after two laps and he is ahead of Ian Locker on the road. Joey Dunlop might not have the physical strength of this man here, David Jeffries, much younger in his prime, the Man Mountain as he has been dubbed this week. Nothing has stopped this man. David Jeffries is absolutely storming around the final lap unofficially Ramsey to Ramsey he is on for a lap record if he can maintain the pace John McGuinness comes out of Ramsey hairpin for the final time and David Jeffries comes through signpost court oh dear he is trying for that lap record he so nearly lost it there David Jeffries is absolutely flying. He's looking for a lap record time and he's taking every risk in the book. Throws the Yamaha around the circuit. The stopwatches are poised and he's done it. 18 minutes. Exactly 18 incredible racing minutes. 125 miles an hour. David Jeffries shatters the lap record and makes history in the process. I think that's made up for not winning the Formula One. It, uh, to be the fastest man round here and the first man in 125, it's, uh, it's pretty special, is that? Not only did Dave have six TT wins under his belt, he'd also become the first man to officially lap the mountain circuit at more than 125 miles an hour. His name now most definitely sat in the record books. It was one of the best laps I've ever done because it just it just seemed to flow together. I mean, it was I just really had to concentrate on. It. I basically thought one corner ahead as I came out of Quarter Bridge. I thought, right, get over to the you know, get in the right position for the next corner. As I came out of Braddon Bridge, I thought, right, get ready for Union Mills, and just sort of basically thought one corner ahead all the way around. Due to precautions brought in to prevent the spread of foot and mouth disease across the British Isles, both the Northwest 200 and Isle of Man TT were cancelled. That meant the first big road race of the year was the Ulster. And David Jeffries has been squeezed out of the line. Last year's winner is right out to the left hand side of your picture on the VM yellow and red Yamaha. So David Jeffries, DJ Jeffries, got a bit of work to do. He's back down in something like fourth place after his second place qualifier. So the pole man locker leads. Heading down towards our camera position at Rushy Hill. David Jeffries has moved up. David Jeffries is up into second place. So Jeffries, winner last year, right there with it. Not had the run out. 
200, not had the run out on the Isle of Man. Jeffries is really, really missing the road scene, but he's back with a bang here at Dundron. Is it going to be the TAS Racing Suzuki Taz Boat? Oh, no, it's not. It's going to be the v and Yamaha at the moment. Jeffries goes through on the flying kilo. But everybody keeping an eye on... Well, oh! I certainly did. Ian Locker right out to the white line and on the grass, and I don't think I'm going to recover too well from that. Locker wants this win big time. Oh, and he's got right with through Wheelers. He's right with David Jeffries. He's alongside David Jeffries. He's past David Jeffries. I don't believe this. This is going to be a battle into the breaking area at the hairpin. Oh, dear me. Ian Locker absolutely committed to taking this race win, or he needs committing, one or the other. So, Locker has the lead. Can Jeffries do it on the brakes? He's going to try and go around the outside, no chance. Locker's going to force him wide. So unless Locker makes a mistake, he has got this race win. And that really will be a valuable scout. Meanwhile, the run down to the chicane. Oh, back Marcus City, you can do it out there, really. 46 there, Roger Wilkinson from Hertfordshire. Didn't know just what was coming his way. Locker wins. David Jeffries celebrates, as David Jeffries only can do, with a massive wheelie. Fast right where you sort of go a little bit light, we're about that far off each other, which was uh, good racing. And then, uh, unfortunately, the back marker decided it for us at Chicane. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I'd have been out to pass him or not, but we never got a chance to find out. No win in the 600s for Jeffries, but there was still the big superbike race to come. However, by now, conditions had worsened. Richard Britton on the 1000cc Yamaha being chased by the other. of you yet. So the only man you see is David Jeffries on a V&M Yamaha. And where has Richard Britton gone? There he is, back in fourth place. Richard Britton has a problem. David Jeffries has been let right off the hook. So Jeffries still looking for a win here at the Ulster Grand Prix 2001. Could this be the one? Certainly the 1,000cc V&M Yamaha is not outclassed in the 960 Honda of Archibald. Oh, Jeffrey's right out on the white line. Well, it is a little drier out under the trees, but not much there. Yamaha versus Honda. Jeffrey's versus Archibald. Archibald, a very smart move there. Oh, class. Judged it absolutely perfectly off of a very fast straight into the left-hander. Archibald hits the front, then Adrian Archibald on the Red Bull Honda. <laughs> and the locals love that, and well they might. No doubt about the winner though. Adrian Archibald brings the Red Bull Honda home to the applause of the local fans. David Jeffries is going to be second. And we have to wait a long, long time for him. And that's why, because he was waiting to get it on the back wheel. This is DJ at his best. He is such a star. No win this time either. Therefore, his best hope of victory lay in the second superbike race. Once more, it was a three-way fight involving both Ian Locker and Adrian Archibald. And yet again, Dave had to settle for another podium position, ending the event with two seconds and a third. He rounded off his year with VNM at the Macau Grand Prix, where he'd won two years earlier. It turned out to be the last time he was to work with Jack Valentine. And, try as he might, he couldn't sign off with a win. Yet, there was still his other favourite pastime, getting John McGuinness in the eye with champagne. It was quite a difficult decision to make. I've been with VNM for a long time. They've brought me, you know, I've been with VNM for all my success in the Isle of Man, but, um, you know, things can't last forever, so I got an offer and it was uh, quite a nice offer. There's no hard feelings at all between myself and Jack from v &M. you know, we still got on well. And uh, it was just one of those things, it was just a decision, a decision I had to make, so it, uh, I'm quite looking forward to it. I mean, the Suzuki is the only bike that's passed me in a straight line while I've been riding the v &M Yamaha, so it's certain the bike's certainly quick enough. With the TT now back on the racing calendar in 2002, Dave was looking forward to returning to the Isle of Man. I think the, uh, the main objective is to try and win a race at the slowest possible speed. So if we can get, uh, if we can get in the lead and uh, we need to do the fast laps, I'm sure I'll be able to do it. But I'm not sure. We'll just plug away and just see what happens, I think. 
the thing with the Alamann is now I've done I've done four years now, so you can you know I can sit and just do every corner in my head, and I made a bit of film myself uh, not so long ago. I actually went out with some friends of mine to a pub and had a few beers and decided to talk around a lap, which was quite embarrassing. And the disappointing thing was it took me 35 minutes, <laughs> so I just hope we can do it a little bit quicker than that. And the new look Jeffrey certainly did go a lot quicker during practice, making him favourite for the first race of the week, the Formula One. Yeah, we got two good laps in. We set off the line then on the superbike and I had the clutch again. <laughs> so straight in, jumped on the production bike, did two laps on the production bike, came in, got to next session straight out on the superbike for two laps and both real good times, so it's been really good. David Jeffries, well, the TAS Suzuki has got to be the bike to beat, I reckon, Julian, because that machine has absolutely been flying throughout the world on the road courses. We shall see. Will it survive the unique rigours of the Arlen Man Mountain Circuit? It's the GSXR 1000 that Keith's talking about there. And DJ, he won here on a Yamaha last time we came here. This time, it's a Suzuki, effectively a factory Suzuki. And those weren't his prizes, should he win this particular race. So the number one bike then gets the Union Jack. And away he goes, David Jeffries off the line, he was fastest in qualifying practice. Second place man, Jim Moody on the line, that's going to be a battle on the VNM Yamaha, especially considering the uh, toing and froing between these men. David Jeffries started a signing for the VNM team, ends up with the TAS Suzuki. There goes Adrian Archibald now, this is our curb cam at the bottom of Bray Hill. Whoa! Whoa. Yes, there's a... Ah, oh, what a sight! DJ on his way. And how this track changes as you change elevation and start on the flat of the mountain, they're up on the top part of it now. We're watching David Jeffries. Leading the way in uh, all well, senses. Dave Jeffries, uh, when he's got his act together here, he's just absolutely majestic. I have to say, straight through, before I have to say it. And there goes myself, DJ. DJ then goes straight through. 125 mile an hour lap for the standing start. Let's see what... Believe. Jeffries McGuinness Locker. Locker has gone through eight seconds adrift of McGuinness. So McGuinness is 11 seconds down on Jeffries, the race leader. Ian Locker is eight seconds further down. Well, looking at lap records, TT Formula One lap records still held by Steve Hislop well, that's on the gonna, Honda. That's going to go if he walks in. Well, I, that's exactly right. And it was back in 1991, over 10 years ago. Okay, you got a minute, no problem. DJ comes into the pits again. So it's fresh rubber and oh, everything all Quick right. drink. He's asked if everything's all right. Nods. Jeffrey's looking good. Yeah, it's going all right. Will you ease off now? You've got a 64 second advantage or are you still going to rev the backside off it? Oh, just keep going like we normally go. <laughs> Technical turn there from Dave Moore then. Uh, rev the backside off it. He has a massive, massive lead at the moment over McGuinness <laughs> and uh, Moody. At the railway lines and up over another famous name, Halewood Rise. Up the hill. That's Number his... one is David Jeffries. Yeah. Already they're uh, clapping him. Brown signpost. Here's Check the flag, flag time then. Now it's only a question about how much he beat them by. Through goes David Jeffries at the end of six laps. Surely he did have a, he had slowed, I think. Uh, he's lost about half his lead. Well. He had a minute plus, it can't be well, that. We wait for McGuinness to go over as victory lane bound goes David Jeffries. David Jeffries is dominant all the way through this race. He did have a minute nine seconds lead. But certainly McGuinness had closed in. We came out of the hairpin on the, um, on the last lap and uh, unfortunately the selected pin inside's come out I think and it just stuck in third gear. So I came out of the hairpin, got second, clunk third and I thought don't dare touch that lever again. So I was coming up the mountain mile, sat in third gear, thinking this is suddenly turning into the mountain three mile. And his maiden TT victory on a Suzuki was rapidly followed by his second win of the week when he powered the GSXR 1000 across the line in the production race. And so we come to the final race of 2002 TT week. What a great festival it's been. David Jeffries blasts off in search of yet another win. He is the lap record holder for this class. This man riding number two this time round is John McGuinness with a big wheelie on the Paul Bird prepared Honda Britain bike. But David Jeffries on the TAS Suzuki is definitely the man to catch this week. Adrian Archibald is on bike number three now. Oh. And here we go again, David Jeffries. Off and running. Straight through there for DJ. So, 126.05 for oh, a standing start. 126.06 for a standing start. <laughs> yes. Well, that breaks his own lap record for this. 
Uh, but this is a standing start lap, of course. Oh, David Jeffries ringing the neck of that Suzuki. But it doesn't, what I was trying to get in early, Keith, DJ, it doesn't look leering or wild, does it? It's controlled aggression. Jeffries leads by five seconds from Locker. McGuinness is a further six seconds down in third place. Quayle is 23 seconds down in fourth. Archibald is another 11 seconds down in fifth. Britain is a second off of Archibald in sixth place. That's how they went through Glen Helen. The thing I like about David Jeffries is how much he likes to ride a motorbike. Doesn't matter what it is. Exactly. It can be a BMW boxer. It can be a, a, an absolute nail of a motorcycle. It can be a super motard. It can be any style of motorcycle anywhere. And David loves to ride it. There's now 15 seconds in it between Jeffries and Locker. So Locker has got work to do. Jeffries now pulling away from Locker, I can tell you that. Locker has increased his time up to 20 odd seconds. This is your race leader, David Jeffries. He's cruising to the end of the end of TT 2002. David Jeffries takes another win here. What a superb 2002 TT for him. I'm absolutely over the moon. I mean, it's really good for the TS Suzuki boys. They've worked really hard putting the bike together. Suzuki have given us a bike to do it. Pirelli tyres and everything. It's just been a really good week. You know, the team have worked hard, Mark and Nigel, and uh, all the boys have worked hard. You know, Putlin have helped us a lot as well. So it's just been really, really good. The perfect week at the TT was rounded off again with the usual champagne fight with close friend and rival John McGuinness. But this wasn't Dave's first excursion on the Suzuki. That had come just a few weeks earlier at the Northwest 200 in Northern Ireland. And yet again, whatever the conditions, Dave proved his mettle. The problem is, as Ian was saying, the wets could tear up with it being quite a bit softer. Here you've got such a high-speed circuit, you know, on the long straight, so it's, it's a gamble. I mean, we'll start to see what happens. Race one, the DeWalt Performance Tool Superbike race, over five laps, and what a nightmare set of conditions this is. After the warm-up lap, there were frantic tyre changes on the grid, most of them going the opposite way to their competitors, so who has got the right tyres on it is an absolute lottery. As they blast off for the first time, Jim Moody to the left of your screen on 21, comes across the front. That's a brilliant start from him on the v &M. Yeah, right, cutting over the nose, number two, Ian Locker. Dave Jeffries there on bike number nine. He is the mover and shaker. Meanwhile, Moody is still the leader. Ian Dufferson looking for his first ever win at the Northwest 200. Richard Britton comes through, but he's got David Jeffries picking a really nice wide line there over the link. Going to pick up a lot of speed as far as the link's concerned because he swept it in there. Jeffries in second place. Jeffries in second place up to something like 180, 190 miles an hour. And out of the slip stream, Richard Britton looked like he was going to go for that as well. But David Jeffries, well, he's been shuttling backwards and forwards from England to the Northwest because he is riding on Sunday in a race over at Silverstone. So uh, Jeffries, a big deal. Oh, that rear end of that bike is spinning. You can hear that motor right up there on the rev limiter. Jeffries next up. He's spinning too. TAS Suzuki versus Richard Britton's Yamaha, the Patio Kane Yamaha, and pulling out. That is, yes, Ian Duffus is pulling out. Duffus is out as well. Well, Moody has gone backwards, and Duffus has now stopped. He's going to look at the rear tyre. There is definitely a tyre problem there, I'm sure. He was looking over his shoulder at the rear end of the motorcycle. Well, we'll find out about that later, but a disaster for him. David Jeffries then on the TAS Suzuki takes the win eventually absolutely easily but he could not have believed that was really going to happen for him. Tyres came into play, David Jeffries or should I say Philip Neal who overruled Hector Neal and David Jeffries' choice of tyres to say what he wanted on the bike was absolutely right. DJ finishes off in style and takes the opening race win here and the opening race of his. It's all been worthwhile Dave all those miles you've covered this weekend. The sun was out for race two, but Dave's hopes of a double were dashed when he was forced to retire. The weather was far from perfect later in the year for the Ulster Grand Prix. But following his success at the Northwest and Isle of Man TT, many expected him to win. And he didn't disappoint, powering his way to victory in the Ulster Grand Prix production race ahead of Ian Locker and Adrian Archibald. Roy.
No sign of Jeffries. There he is. In fact, Jeffries, so it looks as if he'll have to settle for third, unless Gus Scott, who's a lot closer to Jeffries than Jeffries is to McGuinness, he may have a say in who'll take the final podium place. But Jeffries certainly isn't giving up. Big, big power in that big, big bike. Has one final glance, and it's victory for Rutter and the Ducati. McGuinness is second. Jeffries is third, and Scott is almost there, but having to settle for fourth. Dave Jeffries, third place. It all went wrong on the first lap, really. No, if, uh, it was it was actually went to plan, actually. We, um, this year, we've had a few problems with a clutch burning out, so I just didn't give it really real berries off the line, so steady away off the line and thought I'd try and pick my way through, and as it happens, everything went according to plan. Didn't think I'd be able to beat uh, John or Michael. They're riding really well at the minute. And I'm happy for uh, third place. You know, it's the first time Tass have been here. We're on the podium. Pirelli have done it again with the tyres, so I'm really pleased. <laughs> and 2002 was certainly a year of celebration for Jeffries. His success on the roads was matched by his achievements on the short circuits, where he once again displayed his talents on the purpose-built tracks by lifting the British Superstock title in the final round of the series at Donington Park. But once again, Dave's dreams of landing a top short circuit ride were scuppered at the last hurdle. His signature was on the TAS Suzuki contract to compete on the roads during 2003, yet he found himself on his own in the National Superstock Series. The plan sort of went pear-shaped right from the start, really. I was supposed to be with a team called Tech2, who uh, let me down at the very last minute, about three weeks before the start of the season. So. We then had to start and put my own team together, hence the reason the bike's plain white. Um, I've got Pirelli backing me with the tyres, V&J Superbikes have supplied me with the bikes, and the rest of it's coming from me, which is a bit of a pain, really. But um, obviously, you just can't, you know, can't not race. You still have to be racing and keeping yourself dialed in. So that's what we're doing. What more could the bloke do? He won the, you know, the Super Stock Championship. He beat everybody. I mean, he beat Chris Burns, and Chris Burns went on to ride motor G, you know, GP1 machines and. You know, DJ strung a consistent year of last year and he won the championship. And this year he'd, he didn't get his deal, he didn't get, he didn't get the package he wanted. So he thought, well, bugger this, I'll go and get me on. Yeah, I mean, he wanted that really bad. He loved the TT and he'd have always done the TT. But I think if he'd have got a super bike ride and in a competitive team for the full season and it meant him missing the TT, I think he may have missed the TT because I think he really wanted to be on a super bike in the, in the British Championship. It also appeared that Dave's involvement at meetings such as the Isle of Man TT races was scaring off potential superbike employers. Definitely, I mean, two of the teams I've spoken to this year just said, well, if you're going to do the TT, we're not interested. We don't think you're going to give 100% commitment for the UK, which is a lot of rubbish. At over 127 miles an hour, Dave was the fastest man ever at the TT. But the question race fans were asking themselves, could he go faster? I don't know, I don't know what the limit is because when I did 125 everyone said that's the limit, you can't go any quicker, then I did 126 and I've done 127, so it's, um, the limit is at the how comfortable you feel on the day, um, I mean I'd, I do not ride beyond my limit in the Isle of Man, I try and ride well within my limits, I don't take any unnecessary risks, anything that I've, any sort of risks I do take have been thought about and planned, so therefore it's not a risk, it's a planned move. Thursday, May 29th, and the beginning of afternoon practice, with the first race just two days away. This is the session which many consider as the true indication of things to come in race week proper. During the previous morning and evening outings, Dave had been, by his own admission, slightly off the pace. Teammate Adrian Archibald would get this session underway with Dave following close behind. Even though the dangers of racing the TT are foremost in everyone's minds, no one was prepared for what was about to happen. Almost half an hour had been completed when red flags came out to prematurely end the session. At first there was confusion around the paddock as to what had happened. Stories of some kind of accident started to circulate Names were being mentioned, but still there was no confirmation. Then, what many had dared to believe came true. There had been an accident at Crosby, a few miles from the start line. And yes, a rider had indeed lost his life. And it was none other than the TT's fastest ever man, David Jeffries. 
Uh, well, a what a shock, really. Uh, one of my closest friends from racing has paid the ultimate price there, and the TT, you know, and I was first man on the scene. Uh, I can't really call on what's happened. Obviously, you know, in true DJ style, he's been flat out through through the Crosby section, and I was next man behind, and there was a marshal in the road with a yellow flag. Uh, I've presumed the worst and slowed right down to, to you know maybe to 30 mile an hour and come around. And it's been one of the most horrendous scenes I've ever seen in my life. You know, telegraph pole down, wires. Uh, you know, horrendous. Dave had died instantly when he and his machine left the road at Crosby. The racing world mourned. Some questioned whether to continue racing. I went and seen Mr and Mrs Jeffries and explained that I think on account of what happened we'd have to leave. She says, not in a million years do you dare take that man home, says that man's here to race in the TT and you tell him he has to have a safe week's racing and if he can win a race, win it for our David. So I says, well, you can't be any further than that. So I met the Suzuki boss, sir, Nick Barnes, and Nick said, well, if, if we are happy to go, he's he's happy with the, with the, the blessing of the Jeffrey family. So it's a sort of a running now, it's a sort of a tribute to David with Adrian. The Formula One race went ahead and somewhat fittingly was won by Adrian Archibald, Dave's teammate. Also on the podium was his former teammate Ian Locker and best friend John McGuinness. I found out when I was, that David died, um, when I was in a meeting at London, a uh, BMW meeting, and uh, I was with Louise, thankfully, um, and of course it was a terrible moment. Um, my wife rang me and told me and said, David's dead. Uh, there wasn't any other way, she's very matter of fact. Um, I don't think you can dress it up any other way and that's, and that's what happened. I had a moment of disbelief of course, as you naturally probably would do, and then it sort of sunk in. There's it, loads of ifs and buts, but if it, if it was going to happen like it did happen, it was nice in one respect that he did that lap, that first lap over 125, because I know he'll have had a big smile on his face. He'll be chasing Adrian down, and he knew he was on it, you know, and he was going towards Crosby like you know he normally does on the on the right line, and and you know the the, the tragedy happened, and, and we was there, and as was, was Brian Farquhar there, was Richard Britton there, we were all professional riders, we've all won lots of events, and we 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 seen seen what was on the road, and. You know, I mean, I just hope we can do something about it in the future for everybody else's safety as well. He'll have known, without a shadow of a doubt, knowing the way he thinks, knowing the way he operates, that right, I've got it right now. We've got, you know, we've got the bike, the right ballpark, because you can't do 125.4, whatever it was, or that practice lap. You don't do that on a bike that isn't working and that's rotten. You can't. So he'll have been on it, he'll have been concentrating hard, he'll have been fully on it. Some said he had a big smile on his face. Well, I don't know if he had a big smile on his face, but he'd have been quite content at what was going on, where it was going. And I'm pretty sure from the times that I've worked out night and gather that he'd be, he'd be pretty happy with what was happening. And that, you know, is has got to be a, a Got to be something we've got to be thankful for because he he won't have known anything about the crash. It was it's such a speed, so fast. It'd have been absolutely instant. Um, and I know that he's gone out doing what he wanted to do. From a legendary rider to a legendary team now. It's the winning formula from Team TAS. The Isle of Man TT has always been the ultimate test of man and machine. Behind every great rider and motorcycle is the glue that sticks it all together. A great team.
Winning a TT is all about teamwork, putting the best rider and bike package together, preparing those machines for the incredible speed and endurance needed for nearly two hours of flat-out racing on the 37 and three-quarter mile TT course. A race can be won and lost in the pits if the teamwork isn't absolutely perfect. One of the most successful independent teams ever at the TT is TAS from Northern Ireland, owned and run by father and son Hector and Philip Neal. Going into 2018, they had won 17 TTs since 2002 and were hoping to make it 18. For 2018, the team looked as strong as ever, running the super-reliable, super-fast BMW RR1000s ridden by road racing superstar Michael Dunlop and rising star Manxman Dan Neen. TT 2018 could not have started worse for the TAS team when Dan was tragically killed in a practice accident at Milltown, 23 miles into the TT course. After talking with Dan's family, the team decided to race in his honour, and Michael didn't disappoint. Here we go, we're underway! Michael Dunlop is tucked in and on a mission. After the event of this week, this is the result that everybody wanted. Michael Dunlop wins TT Superbike 2018. Michael, you passed his lap on lap two. Any problems? We just got in there, the Tyco BMW was, was, was working well, it just wasn't working the way I wanted it to at the start. We, we sort of turned it around a bit and we started getting a push on and then I seen Dean had retired and then the rest of that lap would just sort of you know, just, just cruised along. I seen my time coming down and thought, right, that pushed and pushed and then I seen Dean obviously and then I, I relaxed but, you know, the, the boys, the pit's done a fantastic job. It's a hard old week for the team, you know what I mean? And I said, I just wanted to say it's the only way we can sort of repay Dan and hopefully, you know what I mean, it's, as I said, it's a nice tribute off to him as I said, sadly I wasn't here to see it. We love the dedicate that went to Dan Dean. It's been such a, an emotional week for you, hasn't it, for the team? Difficult, I imagine, for everybody. Was there any thoughts about, about not riding today? Yeah, it was such a shock because he had such potential and the way he was coming up. I was saying, we had a bit of luck here, you could have two BMWs in Napoleon, but I'm afraid there's only going to be one. It's been sad, but it's motorbike racing. Eighteen TT wins for the TAS team, an incredible story. But it all started over 60 years ago at home in Northern Ireland when Hector was a young boy. It started with nothing. It was a dream. A wee boy at school. We used to sit outside an old gas lamp outside our door and we'd speed off the old park road and we'd be talking about what we're going to do when we grow up. One was going to be a footballer and somebody was going to play this and do that. What are you going to do, Hector? I said, I'm going to go to the Isle of Man and win the TT. And he looked at me, where's that? I said, I don't know, but I heard about it. I asked my dad, I says, he knows a bit more about it. I says, we'll ask him. The next morning I went to school, I said, you ask your dad. I did, he says. I said, what did he say? He laughed, he says, he says to tell actor Neil his head's cut. He wouldn't even know where the Isle of Man was, never mind going and win the TT. Hector did find the Isle of Man and his dream did come true when Norman Brown won the senior TT on a Suzuki in 1982 for Hector Neal Racing. Three people, Brian Madol, Stanley Moore and me, we had Suzuki, a quick fill and equipment I bought in Daytona and we won the senior. Roll on to 2000, after a successful career riding motocross, Philip Neal decided to retire from the sport and, with his dad, form a new road racing team, TAS. And, as they say, the rest is history. We were known as Tampa Lot of Salvages, he went to the scrapyard business going in. Damaged cars, you name it, we're still doing it. And the fact that it was called Tampa Lot of Salvages, I said, wait a minute, got a good idea here. 
And I says to Philip, Philip was saying, what are we going to call this team we're starting? It's only one bike. And he says, Toss racing. And believe it or not, he said to me, do you know something? He says, bloody good idea. So, with the new team name decided and the start of the season only a couple of months away, all the team needed now was a rider and some bikes. I suggested the idea to Hector, what about, you know, let's contact Suzuki. At that time, they had had an absence as well for, you know, for their own reasons. And we had a very, very brief conversation. They agreed to support it. And we were left then with a very short space of time to, to secure a rider. I was approached at the end of 1999 um, by Hector, or it was actually through Brian Reid, I think, at the time, um, and uh, it was a friend of the team, and they just sort of asked, um, you know, what are your plans, and I had no plans at the time, and uh, I was just sort of getting back into the, the four-stroke thing, because I'd ridden the, tried to ride the four-strokes many years earlier and couldn't do it, they weren't very nice um, things to ride, but then th at that sort of the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, they sort of changed and they became a lot more user-friendly for a, a smaller frame person, basically. With the rider and bikes in place, something happened that no team could plan for, foot and mouth. Honestly, the foot and mouth thing was well, it was a disaster for everyone, and clearly the right decisions were made at the, at the time. And you know, racing was the least of importance, but for us, it was an absolute, it was a massive letdown because the bike, as I say, turned out uh, by chance. Really, the bike turned out to be phenomenal at that time. I mean, it was a, it was a class leading package at that stage. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to race it anywhere other than the Ulster Grand Prix at the end of the season. With TT wins always a priority, the opportunity arose to get the top man on the TAS bikes. Ironically, what kicked off the conversation with, with David Jeffries, as you say, he had said, and he later told me, that he'd never had anything pass him in a straight line whilst he was on the v &M bike at the time. He'd never had anything pass him in a straight line. And he, he actually said to me that Locker almost sucked the stickers off him on the way past. I went head to head with David Jeffries on, on the, he was on the v &M Yamaha. I was on Suzuki and I just gelled with the bike, and uh, we had a, we had a, it was really good race, um, and I ended up beating him by you know like half a second or something. So.
David Jeffries was the man to beat at the TT. He had six wins and had also set the lap record on the V&M Yamaha. And it's 125 miles an hour. He has <laughs> broken the 125 miles an hour oh, barrier. Oh. Rumours started to circulate that he was that he was potentially interested in a change. And uh, again, bold enough, he didn't know me, I didn't know him, but I made contact and you know, he was very aware of, of who we were now because of that, because of the bike and what Ian had done on it. David Jeffries, well, the TAS Suzuki has got to be the bike to beat, I reckon, Julian, because that machine has absolutely been flying throughout the world on the road courses. We shall see. I had an absolute burning desire that we were going to, that we were going to be in that winner's enclosure. The number one bike then gets the Union Jack, and away he goes, David Jeffries off the line, he was fastest in qualifying practice. Second place man Jim Moody on the line. That's going to be a battle on the VM Yamaha, especially considering the uh, toing and froing between these men. David Jeffries started signing for the EVM team, ends up on the TAS Suzuki. There goes Adrian Archibald now. This is our curb cam at the bottom of Bray Hill. Whoa! Whoa. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, what a sight. DJ on his way. Oh, I think he means it. There goes at number five, John McGuinness, second of the Honda Fireblades, the yep. Morgan man. Winner of Macau, remember, on that motorcycle last winter and flying. Now he's got over his illness. There's Jim Moody. DJ again. David Jeffries again. On it. Yeah, Absolutely really. on it. DJ then goes straight through. 125 mile an hour lap from a standing start. Let's see what. Believe. Yes, I would from David Jeffries, and certainly looking at that, it's going to be interesting to see where the rest are in relation to that. Through goes Moody. After just one lap, it was obvious that the Tas Suzuki and David Jeffries were going to be a formidable partnership. McGuinness is in second place, 11 seconds adrift of Jeffries. Got a minute, no problem. As DJ comes into the pits. So it's fresh rubber and oh, everything all Quick drink. He's asked if everything's all right. Nods. Jeffrey's looking good. Yeah, seems to be going all right. Will you ease off now? You've got a 64 second advantage, or are you still going to rev the backside off it? Oh, just keep going like we normally go. <laughs> Technical turn there from Dave Moore, then uh, rev the backside off it as if he wasn't. Ian Lockup, <laughs> he's another one revving the backside off of it. TAS Suzuki's. It's been a long time since Suzuki won this race. I don't think I'll tempt fate by uh, talking about that with only half the race gone. Was he looking at the clutch? So Adrian Archibald with a problem. Oh, it's exhaust. The exhaust has come off. Well, it can happen to anybody, and it could happen to this man yet, despite the fact he has a massive, massive lead at the moment over McGuinness. <laughs> and uh, Moody is uh, sticking in the slipstream there of John McGuinness. Well... We watch number 23 That's go milky. through. Yeah, it is Milky Quail. Haven't it's a good ride. There's that Locker. Elk? Locker in the. Well, Locker is just. Can he close in? Can Locker well, close that's, in? That's the question, isn't it? With Archibald out. Here's check a flag. Time, then. Through goes David Jeffries at the end of six laps. He has slowed, I think. I mean, he's lost about half his lead. A dream start for the dream team, race one of TT 2002 in the bag. Well, it's just unbelievable. You, you stood outside, sort of shaking your head and said, am I dreaming this? You know, this, this can't be real. But just the, the feeling of it alone was like, it was another time and another place, I can tell you. But we'd done it with before with the, the Norman Brown scenario, but for going in there with Philip alone, Philip hadn't been in before. So he was more chuffed than me because he never thought, well, that get in there in a million years, you know. There you are. It didn't take them long to clock up win number two when DJ did it again in Monday's production 1000 race. Lock it close enough to make sure DJ. This keeps is going to be pacer. interesting. Run down towards Brandish now. Hands in the air from the fans. This is Locker. Well, really, we're going to have to wait for Locker, but unless uh, David Jeffries has had some gearbox problem, as he did, of course, in the Formula One race at the beginning of the week on Saturday, had a problem with the gearbox, and they, they closed him down by something like 40 seconds over yep. the mountain. He's waving at the... I'm sure he's waving at the helicopter, I've, then. That's the only rational... Is that rational explanation? Certainly the not cheeky rational. cheeky so-and-so. Not rational from a normal point of view, but there is David Jeffries. He's going to win this race for sure. Big Dave has plenty of reason to celebrate, but what about Ian Locker? A 1-2 for the TAS team, and we were only halfway through the week. I imagine if Ian's honest, he was probably 
in one way pleased to be riding with alongside of David, and another way he was probably a, a bit annoyed because if, clearly if, if David hadn't been, uh, well, I don't want to say if he hadn't been on that that bike that year, that's probably a little bit unfair. But he was he was he was being beaten by his teammate and and only on only by his teammate. Otherwise, he may be thinking, oh, hang on, I could have been I would have been winning here. We're looking at Locker. In fact, we've almost got one of the skids of the helicopter on his head. Beautifully tucked in. Later on that week, things got even better for Ian Locker with a fantastic win in the production 600 race, taking the TAS win total to three with the senior still to come. Ian Locker then comes up the Glencutry Road. What a superb week it's been for the Welshman. Just a class 600 is an amazing little bike and uh, just like I said the other day, it's just so easy to ride. Um, you just jump on them and just ride them. You know, it's just a bike you can go shopping on or anything's brilliant. Nice big purse of prize money and of course a nice big silver trophy to take home with him. And so we come to the final race of 2002 TT Week. What a great festival it's been. David Jeffries blasts off in search of yet another win. He is the lap record holder for this class. This man riding number two this time round is John McGuinness with a big wheelie on the Paul Bird prepared Honda Britain bike. But David Jeffries on the TAS Suzuki is definitely the man to catch this week. So it was the big one, the senior TT, the last race of the week. DJ and Tas Suzuki started red hot favourites and neither would disappoint. Jeffries and Locker are the two that are locked together. And, uh, I'm just checking the timings before. There was 10 seconds in it a while ago. Then Locker picked up that penalty. There's now 15 seconds in it between Jeffries and Locker. Gosh. So Locker has got work to do. And we've still got McGuinness in third. Oh, that was... <laughs> Number 27, who is Gary Carswell. This is your race leader, David Jeffries. He's cruising to the end of the end of TT 2002. David Jeffries takes another win here. What a superb 2002 TT for him. It's just been really, really good. The perfect week for Tass at the TT. Four wins on the board. But triumph would soon turn to tragedy. With four TT wins, TAS was really starting to make a name for themselves and for 2003 they retained Suzuki and David Jeffries, who was definitely the man to beat after his triple in 2002. And he would be joined by a young Adrian Archibald from Ballamoney in Northern Ireland, just down the road from the team's base. Adrian Archibald tucked down behind the screen of the TAS Suzuki. I will absolutely be honest here. The, the opportunity to, to to have a Northern Ireland rider in the team was was good. You know, I, I, I was obviously alongside alongside David, and again, I thought he was quite uh, he was brave. He was brave to enter into that, but he was quite confident. I got on well with it, and he kept himself to himself. But uh, you know, he voluntarily wanted to start to know more about the training programs that we'd had through through the guys that were looking after that for us, and and he he jumped on to that. And I have to say, I've to this day, I've probably never seen anyone change their their lifestyle and their routine as much as Adrian did. Uh, he worked, 
his backside off that winter. Adrian Archibald joins David Jeffries and after the success of the previous year, Tass was on the crest of a wave. But that would soon change when DJ was killed in a practice crash at Crosby four miles into the TT course. Um, yeah, I obviously hadn't experienced that firsthand and, 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 and never, never wanted to experience it. It's, racing's dangerous and, and, you know, it was definitely a huge shock to the system. Like you say, we were, we were in such a high and, and all of a sudden we were, you know, plummeted into the, the lows uh, and all the, the different emotions that come with that. It was obviously a difficult year, you know, difficult time with, um, with David's accident. Everybody felt a bit sort of completely kicked in the what's it? you know, it was just terrible. Um, nobody expected it, just like, you know, we expected with Joey Dunlop, being the same thing, you know, it's just one of those persons that you never thought it would happen to, you know. We were taking the, the tent, the only and all down, went up, the paddock came as mum. What are you doing? I says, look, we're sorry to hear about David, but we're finished for putting this away. What do you mean you're putting it away? I says, we're taking it home. Indeed you are not, she says. You gone home? What did Adrian say? I says, uh, and he didn't say much. She went over and spoke to him. She says to me, you leave that up. You know what? And she says, hey, David, you go you out there, she says, and win. Or Adrian, go you out there and win. One of them races for me, David. And, I mean, I went out and won a bloody two of them, aren't you, Mum? Indeed. I says, that's a tribute. There can be no better tribute to DJ himself than for Adrian Archibald to step up and take over and give the team the victory uh, that everybody wants. It's going to be a very popular win. Adrian Archibald then comes to win his first TT. It is the Formula One TT 2003. Superb finish from Adrian Archibald and a very emotional day indeed. I'm usually fairly relaxed, but I was really nervous today going out in the race. And, you know, it took me a few laps to get settled in. To be honest, I struggled in the first, first and second lap, but then, you know, things came together for me after that. Hale would rise as we come up from the tram lines. It is Adrian Archibald well on his way now to taking his second TT win ever. His second TT win of 2003. What an emotional week it's What's been. What's going on here? <laughs> Ryan Farquhar is in front of Ian Locker. John McGuinness in second place. But here he is on his way to the finish. Adrian Archibald at Governor's Dip then, no mistake from him. What an emotional week it has been for the TAS Suzuki team. Two wins though for Adrian Archibald and no doubt he will dedicate this one to DJ as well. Adrian's a quiet character at the best of times, um, you know, which was probably helpful at that, at, at that stage because, you know, he disappeared into his own corner. <clears throat> um, and, and came back and I don't know where he found the, the, the mental reserve, but he did. He came back and, and done the job, which had now obviously, in a strange way, become even, become even more important. Yeah, he was brilliant, absolutely. He, he always was a good rider, but we just didn't get a couple of wee things right for him at the start, because it was, it was a bit of a rock. We were only on these bikes at the time. But uh, when he, that day he won them two races, you know, there was nobody amongst them. He was just there from the word go, or both his. Look at Adrian Archibald. Everywhere you see him, he's absolutely leaping curb to curb. Being a four lap race, uh, I knew I had to go really quick from the start because John always goes quick there. I uh, got plus one, you know, most of the way in the first lap, and I knew if I was there about at that stage, he knew that I could probably get the better of him at the end. There wasn't much of a celebration. It wasn't a time to celebrate. Clearly, very very difficult to be in that position as well. You don't you don't really know what's expected of you. You don't really know what to expect of yourself. and But however difficult it was for me, it must have been 10 times more so for Adrian. Somewhat reluctantly, I have to say, continued on the rest of that year. Um, again, you know, it's it's one thing gathering your emotions together to, to carry on during the week at the, TT, at the TT when you're already there and people are expecting you to race. But when you come back, in the workshop and you know there's we weren't doing a lot of racing at that, that particular year and um, there was only one more 
uh, road race wise was only one more important venue for us and that was Ulster Grand Prix and it would have been easy to not to not compete but we did and uh, if memory serves me right we yeah absolutely we had been asked very very late in the day would we have an interest in putting Bruce Ansey out on the bike. For 2004, Adrian stays with the team and is joined by quiet Kiwi and proven TT winner, Bruce Anstey. We put together another motorbike, a new motorbike for, for Bruce. It wasn't even quite a full-blown superbike. It was a bit of a hybrid type thing because, again, we hadn't got a lot of time. So we put that together for Bruce and then, and then we agreed, uh, from that, we agreed to, for Bruce to come on board. Bruce was brilliant for us. I know that. And so he, one day the big, one of the fuses went on and it cut on out leading to miles. And uh, I said, well, funny you hear him on ground and go, clean bond. And it just stands smiling. He just says, ah, oh, these things happen. He says, and I says, well, fair enough. You know, we were brilliant. Those Suzuki we had, you know, we better work done them ourselves, you know. But they were, they were quick. And they could just walk away with us. A great result for Bruce Anthony and for Hector and Philip Neal and the rest of the Taz Suzuki team. It's their first win of the week and what a race to win. He definitely had a circuit style of, of racing in comparison to most of the guys who had been, you know, who'd come initially, who started in road racing. But he was a lot more aerodynamic than anyone. I mean, Bruce could run a, a lower a lower screen height than anyone that I've ever worked with in road racing before ever and, and, and in fact used to fight with me um, because I used to try and put a taller screen in the bike all the time and he just did not want it, he didn't want it um, because he rode the bike on the tank and if you look at any pictures of Bruce anywhere in a corner you, you know he rarely comes up you know he rarely comes up off the tank he's always he's always aerodynamic and streamlined. Another great TT win for Adrian Archibald in the senior and a second win of the week for TAS Racing. That is John McGuinness in Kurt Michael what? and he is looking for somewhere to park for Yamaha. I wonder whether they had some kind of a problem and that's why they were a few seconds longer in the pits. They were trying to cure something perhaps but he looks upset there. Did you see that little bit of emotion from John McGuinness Blisters on his hands and he can see our chopper. It's Archibald, Anstey, Carswell, Chris Heath, Martin Finnegan and then Mark Parrott. So it's all changed in the final few miles of this TT course and they're waving to Adrian Archibald as he comes down off the hill. 40 seconds to the good. Here's the flag. Archibald then. A senior win for Archibald, his third big bike win for Tass, but a shock for the team when he announces he's moving on. It's 2004 and TAS now have eight TT wins. From the outside, it looks like the dream team with superfast Kiwi rider Bruce Anstey and local star Adrian Archibald, until Philip gets a knock on the door. I recall the day that he came to speak to me and he was unbelievably shy and he did not want to have the conversation with me. He really didn't, but he sat down and he, he, he looked away from me and, and, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride another bike, basically. I'm, I, but it's quite late in the day, you know, and um, yeah, you never, you don't want to fall out over these things. It was, it was a relationship based, you know, largely on, on friendship and respect rather than, rather than a business side. And if, I've always been the same, same, same to this day. If a, if a writer doesn't want to be here enough, then they shouldn't be here. We shook hands and they went, we went our separate ways. Bruce had now established himself as a very, very significant teammate, and 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 you know, as much as we try to create an equality for the riders at, at, at all times. I don't know whether that changed Adrian's way of thinking. 
Adrian Archibald leaves the team only to return again a few months later. That was Bruce Almighty through the bottom of Bray Hill. Both riders again, two very, very equal riders, two very different riders, but two very equal riders, results capability wise, probably at that time. Again, Bruce, definitely much, much stronger on a, on a Super Sport 600. Phenomenal, actually, on the Super Sport 600. He was practically unbeatable. Bruce Anstey is definitely looking for a pass on Paul Hunt. They started 10 seconds apart, so you can see how much distance he's made up, and there he goes, passing him out of Windy Corner. Adrian was actually looking like the likely winner of the, the Superstock that day. The two of them were circulating side by side, which was probably one of my best ever memories of from road racing, was seeing those two bikes. It was a sunny day. Um, you know, the, the bikes, the, the, the Royal Metallic Blue, was uh, looked phenomenal and the two of them in matching race suits. They were, they were on the road together. These two are just shoulder to shoulder. What are they doing? Adrian Archibald and Bruce Hensley. Well, the spectators will be loving this short circuit stuff. It was difficult at the time with the, with the tank sizes and the bits and pieces. Fuel consumption was always an issue to TT and we were, we were just a smidgen under with, with the fuel for Adrian and he, he just didn't quite make it the last couple of miles. As Adrian Archibald looks over his shot, and he puts his hand up! Adrian Archibald, it can only be petrol. He stopped for five seconds less. He knew it, didn't he? Look at him, the body language. He knows exactly what's wrong with that. But we, we, we gathered to win up with Bruce anyway, as you say. And Archibald parks it on the safe side of the road. Well, it's all over for him. The smiling Kiwi is on his way to TT win number four. Coming into the bungalow, he just ran wide and I thought, what's going on here? And then he, he just stopped. So I just brought it home. So the team boss is, is taking the blame today? The team boss is taking the rap here for this. I'm completely shattered. I can't believe it. You've forgiven him anyway? Yeah, I have. You know, I don't think we can sack the team owner. <laughs> we were probably more annoyed for him than, than he maybe was for himself. By that time, Bruce Anstey was the main man, and he went on to win the Superstock TT for the next three years, taking the TAS TT wins total to 11. For 2008, it wasn't quite all change. Bruce Anstey was retained. Adrian Archibald would leave. The TAS Suzuki's were now in the colour scheme with the relentless energy drink and likeable Aussie Cameron Donald would join the team. He came on board to join Bruce, so we were, you know, all in tip of the end at that point in time. Um, again, established a great relationship. Cameron came to live nearby in Cookstown and we, we got on really well. It was, it was actually uh, one of our mechanics, Lee, Lee Finney, who's been with us from that time and is still with us to this day. I mean, he had worked for Cameron previously the year before. So again, there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a familiarity at that point in time when we started to talk to Cameron. You know, the pleasantly surprising when I, when I found out, you know, how big a desire he had to join us. I wanted to ride for Taz because I was such a successful team at the TT. The bikes were always immaculately prepared and you know it didn't matter who was on board their bike they were always in contention for a result so when the opportunity arose to ride for them um, it was not only a privilege but it was a, a dream come true I just grabbed it with both hands and, and gave it my all. His desire was to strong desire was to join us and obviously that makes it really really easy when you it does, it's not about money then or, or anything else it's obviously involved but it's, it's that's not the reason why Cameron wanted to be here. These two are shaping up for a formation finish because they are just a couple of miles away from the finish line in Douglas in a race that's been characterised by extraordinary power and performance, high speeds, very, very tiny margins between the top half a dozen riders. And here comes Adrian Archibald, third place. He's been off the podium for a long time. He's been away from the top step of the podium since 2004. He's been riding well, but not as well as that. Cameron Donald wins his first TT. 
hats off to all the boys. I mean, the Suzuki just ran so well coming up over that mountain the last time. And I know now what the boys talk about when they say they're listening to the bike and whatnot. So I was really thinking, come on, girl, but she just, just ran beautifully all the way to the end and everything worked really well. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Again, background in my opinion, hard work. Cameron had done his work, you know, physically he was he was strong and fit anyway, but he'd, he'd worked even harder than normal. He'd went, he'd done the laps. To me, that's again, it might be just something that I see more than most people. But I mean, that was sacrifice and commitment again, and I think you you need to you need to do that in anything to get to expect the result. That first superbike win was the best feeling in the world. I remember standing on that TT podium looking at the Australian flag, you know, waving above the grandstand as I listened to the Australian anthem. And I thought, you know what, all the training, all the pain, all the injuries, all the sacrifice, it was all worth it for that moment. Here's Cameron Donald. Can he make it a hat trick? Lots of people have taken three wins from the TT. He'd like to do that, I'm sure. Um, I, I firmly believe Cameron would have done the double that year. Um, he was just a repeatedly all week. He'd been he'd been aggressive at the bottom of Bagaro, and we were doing everything we could to protect the bottom of the engine. Uh, everything we could. I mean, we lined the belly pan with aluminium, and we'd we'd done everything that we possibly could. Cameron Donald had lost 13 seconds. Cameron Donald, I think, is in trouble, Keith, because he's losing time hand over fist on this final lap. Looking down on the Kenny Harker bike of Ryan Farquhar at the moment as he weaves his way through the Manx roads. This is Ian Hutchinson on the 8 bike, the AIM Yamaha. Well, Hutchie's third. Will he catch Cameron Donald? How bad is whatever the problem is for Cameron Donald? John McGuinness definitely knows it now, coming through Ramsey. He's 24 seconds in front of Cameron Donald on his way to win number 14. Will this promote everybody else? Is Cameron Donald out of it as Gary Johnson rounds off a perfect win? I like Cameron. Cameron, nice wee boy. Cameron should have won, you know. And that l last lap to go in Big Yarra, I told him about it. Was, I'd seen the big through practice. I said, hey, but you're buffing the bottom of this sump here. <coughs> I said, he's a wee bit in Big Yarra, just to, not to put her down. So he knew he was in the lead. And as we look back down from the gooseneck, and again, Cameron Donald looking down at the bike, so that relentless Suzuki is sick. Oh, he is not going to make Is he going to make second place? He braked. To slow the bike down. <laughs> He's into the bottom this time as he breaks, he went down lower and he said he heard the thump bang. But he went on the head, but when he got away out of Ramsey, he could see there was oil on his boots. I says, What'll I do? And he, he looked at the board and he said he was a good clear second. McGinnis was going to win it. So he, he, he said he started to count the money up in his head and he says, I just kept going. Fair play to the boy. He, he kept he kept going and brought her home in, in second place. And I remember when he came in and the boot was covered in oil. And I remember John looking down and said, "Rather you than me." Even though the team were disappointed not to win the senior, it had been a fantastic week with Cam also winning the Super Stock race and Bruce winning Super Sport two. So, three wins for TT 2008, and the team total now up to an incredible 14. Over the next two years, Cameron and Bruce continued with the team, scoring podiums but not quite making the top step. But for 2011, it was all change. It was, that was maybe... I was maybe a little bit more on, on, on our side than it, than it was on, on, on Bruce's side. It was a really difficult, difficult thing to go through. I remember it was one of the most emotionally taxing times ever in racing. I'll be honest with you, it was, a, it was, a, it was something I f felt had to happen, but I didn't want it to happen. There were things that I just couldn't change for Bruce, unfortunately. It was out of my ability to, to change. And, and it was clear, it was clear for a, a decent period of time before we did part that he wasn't fully comfortable and, and, it, was, and it was just time to make a, it was time to make a change and, and look, I think it proved to be the right change because we went on to have success and he went on to have success. A new rider and a whole new bunch of pressures. I knew that the guy commercially and, and, and management wise, I knew that that would be another challenge. It, you know, having had a few years already working with the ones that I had, Bruce 
phenomenally talented, you know, more challenging on that side. Cameron, very easy to work with on the commercial aspect of it. Some riders are just different than others. Some riders kind of enjoy the camera a bit more than others. And, and clearly at that time, Guy wasn't, wasn't one of them. For Guy, it was all about the engineering. You really have to be prepared when you, when you first engage in conversation with Guy because if you don't know the answers to the questions, you didn't know it at the time, but all the, each of the questions are a test and you have to know the answers with Guy. And uh, of course, if, if I didn't, you know, maybe tried to bluff my way through things and you quickly realise that that's not the way to work with Guy. If you don't know the answer, just tell him you don't know the answer and you'll come back to him. Interesting character, enjoyed our time with him. Um, you know, again, helped helped uh, raise the profile of the team to another level and, and hope, hopefully we helped manage him through his, uh, those probably couple of reasonably difficult years. Obviously, okay, didn't win, didn't, didn't manage to win a TT with him again. He had some of them in the bag. I mean, he should have won a TT in all honesty. The, the, the first one that we won with Cameron in, uh, in 07, arguably Guy was in the lead of that race on a, on a, on a Honda and, and should have, could have maybe, but didn't. During Guy Martin's stay at TAS, he had a number of teammates. Frenchman Guillaume Dietrich, Manxman Connor Cummins, Japanese rider Yoshinari Matsushita, who was sadly killed in 2013 practicing for the Supersport race, Josh Brooks, and from the Dunlop dynasty, William. TAS Suzuki had always been TAS Suzuki, but even that was about to change. I tried to talk myself out of it, I think, in many ways, because I felt such a loyalty to Suzuki. But, uh, and again, you know, Hector's the same. We'd had a, we'd had a flipping lifetime with Suzuki, it, it felt like. So we really, genuinely, one part of us didn't want to move. Move they did to the rocket ship that is the BMW 1000 RR. There would also be a new rider. 11-time TT winner Ian Hutchinson would ride the BMWs. Very demanding guy, very, very demanding guy to work with. I mean, on a personal level, you know, not at all what he seems, very personable, very, very friendly. But when it comes racing, he's very serious and he's, and he's very demanding of what he wanted and, he, and, he's, and he's not afraid to say that. We got back to winning ways with um team traction control on the 600 and with Paul Bird's bike on the Kawasaki and then the offer come from BMW and didn't really want to leave what I had at the time because it was working good but um, it was a chance to get back involved with a manufacturer and a sort of factory back team so you know after quite a long time of discussions and thoughts you know they made me feel like it was going to be the right thing to do and that was it. Again, the ethos of us as a team, we've always tried to give him what the rider what they need. You know, he said what he wanted, we give him what he needed, and he done he done the job. Rutter is clinging on. Harrison looks like he's flying. Rutter looks like he's out for a Sunday ride. <laughs> Different styles. Look at that, it's sliding over the top of the hill, dropping back down. As Ian Hutchinson looks over his shoulder, I don't know what he's looking for. Pulls a massive wheelie to go over the line to take his 13th TT win and 22nd podium. Big burnout for Hutchie, absolutely brilliant. I'll tell you why they really enjoyed that last lap. Surprised me beyond belief as, as to how competitive he was. And really, he really shouldn't have done because he, you know, before his injury he was a strong British Championship rider as well. But for me, I wasn't just sure that he would, you know, that he would he would put the commitment into the British Super stock that he did. And, you know, he almost won the championship. He won several races for us. And it meant, what that meant was by the time we arrived at June, the bike was already a very, very strong package. He knew the bike inside out and he had a lot of confidence in it. He'd had success on it on circuits. So when it came there, when it came the time of the TT, I honestly think Ian had the mindset that he wasn't going to be beaten. So Hutchinson comes up to the line, but we're going to have to wait for the clock to see who has won this race. It does look like it's got Hutchinson all over it. 15 wins it will be for him, equaling Mike Kailwood. Will be if you manage to do this win, Steve. But the way this race has been swapping back and forth, we're going to have to wait for the clock on this one. Dean Harrison over the line. I'm pretty certain that's going to put him in third place. Uh, we wait for the number 10 bike to come over the line, and it's Hickman. Uh, confirmation of those results. Hutchinson does it by five seconds. Harrison a great third, Ilya fourth.
After his Superbike win, he also took the Superstock later in the week. Could he make it a hat-trick in the senior? This is unbelievable. Now, we've already done a lap and a half of the 37 and three-quarter mile mountain circuit, and they're separated by less than a tenth of a second. Yeah, up through Guthrie's corner we go through here. This has come up to 27th, up onto the mountain, then it's the mountain mile, which has got the speed up the top here into the right hand. Oh! Hutchie's down. He's... Yeah, he, Hutch, Ian Hutchie, number four, has gone down. Well, he look, he's, he's up. Oh, he's well, he's sat up anyway. I think a few things fell in, in place for us, but we got success. And then, unfortunately, uh, yeah, super stock wise, he was he was he was still dominant. But uh, unfortunately, then you know had the crash in the senior, which was an unfortunate way to end things. Hector just loves his racing, um, and and Phillips just so passionate about making sure everything's prepared properly and looks. The business and we've got everything we need for it so yeah it was uh, always a, a good atmosphere in the team and the guys have stuck with the team for a lot of years we're all irish based staff in the in the workshop and stuff and yeah it worked good so injury for hutchie opens the door for the dream team northern irish team tasks signed northern irish road racing superstar michael dunlop and I've been helping the Dunlops away from the early days, from Joey's days, right up through. Uh, Look, Dunlop, the Dunlop name is iconic in this country, well, globally within in racing circles. It's no secret we had a strong desire to get involved. We'd had the two, the two years with William uh, prior to that, one, one on Suzuki and, and then the next one on the BMW. Two very fruitful years where, where William won his, his, uh, his first ever Superbike Northwest 200 for us in that uh, iconic battle with, with Michael that day. William oh, Dunlop did that excellently and he shuts the door on him as well. Oh, that was close. And he takes the win. After a win in the Superbike TT in 2018, Tass and Michael Dunlop will be a real force together this year. He's planned his, his, his attack this year, so I'm just hoping for big things. But as a person, I'm having the best. He doesn't. He goes a speed of speed, like <laughs> I swear, you know. But uh, I don't mind that. What's my way, the highway? As I say, I'll give it 110 percent, no matter what it takes. Uh, and if it's good enough in the day, great. And if it's not, screw it. That's the way it is. You can't, you know, it's no point of getting too emotionally attached about it. You know, I can only do what I can do, and, and if that's good enough, uh, that's that's good. Door handles and hedges, that's all I'm looking for. So you just ride as hard as you can. And okay, it's different. Look at for your last lap, and, you, and it's not even like, you know, you think if you've got last lap and you, and you can, and you're leading, it's, you can't smile because, you know, she could herself on the way home or you know you, you know you run out of fuel break down you just so you never get a chance until you know I've said it before until you're past the actual checker flag you know there is anything can happen I'm always in the head I'm here to win this you know, can't you don't think that way you're not going to do it I let the boys all do their job and I stay in the background just watching but we'll make sure everything's done right and we know whenever after a bit of practice over I says we're there so let's hope this year, with Michael at the helm, it'll happen. If it does, I'll be, he'll meet one happy man, I can tell you.
Hello and welcome to the first ever virtual TT powered by Motul. Yeah, you heard me right. Virtual TT. We are going to see some racing action in 2020, albeit in the virtual world. Thanks to the launch of the new TT Isle of Man 2 Ride on the Edge game, the race organizers thought it was the perfect opportunity and the perfect platform to host the first virtual TT. So we've invited eight TT riders and teamed them up alongside eight gamers to create, well, eight teams of two riders who will compete over one lap each of the TT course. Once the riders have completed their laps, the times will be added together for both rider and gamer, and the team will be given an aggregated time. Now, whoever's at the top of the leaderboard, come the end of the eight competitors taken to the course, they'll be crowned virtual TT winners for 2020. And if you need reminded just how fast paced and exhilarating the TT is, feast your eyes on this. Without further ado, it's time to meet the first team awaiting that top on the shoulder to head down Bray Hill. And the team captain for Team 1 is no stranger to the TT. Making his TT debut in 2013, he's the fastest rider to ever lap the TT course on a Yamaha. His first victory came last year in the classic junior TT. It's Jamie Coward! Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! It is, of course, Jamie Coward. We see Jamie Coward there heading through Milltown. Now here is Jamie Coward, a man to keep an eye on. Jamie Coward. I noticed on that VT there that you've got the word relax over your clocks. Is that something that you need to remind yourself to do while you're racing around the TT course? Uh, uh, yeah, it is actually. It's uh, some one of them things that if you be a bit tense and a bit worked up about the whole job then yeah it's just a nice uh thing to see and just just helps you calm down and like i said just relax have, have you got it on your control pad ready for the uh the lap around the tt course <laughs> yeah i have actually yeah no i am really no 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 it's uh i don't need it on there so jamie obviously very difficult times for everybody across the world um how gutted are you about not actually attending the tt this year uh, yeah, I think everyone uh, everyone that rides the TT and everyone that uh, obviously looks forward to that event, you've got to look at the big, bigger picture and everyone's safety, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but end of the day, it's just, it's just one of them things. So, how have you been getting on with the game? Obviously, I'm on it all the time, so I've got kids and family and stuff, but uh, when I can get on, I just go on there and then, like, so it just keeps you. It's quite, it's very realistic, really, to the course and the, the, the corners and stuff. And it just, it just keeps your mind sharp and just keeps you uh, up to speed, really, with stuff. But obviously, with everything we're going through, it's just uh, nice to get some sort of laps into it. Jamie, let's meet your teammate. It's avid gamer Kenny Lamb. Kenny, thank you for joining us. Now, how many hours have you clocked up around the TT course in the virtual world? I think I can count the hours I've clocked on it, probably under 10. So it's a super steep learning curve. I went from not being able to get through section one without crashing to only crashing a handful of times. So yeah, what what, what do you think of that video when you see Jamie doing what he does for, for a living? It, it, I mean, I, I've been there, I've seen it, and it still blows me away. My mind is actually blown. Um, even from playing the game, I have no idea how you guys react so quickly. So, Jamie, before we get into Kenny's lab, have you got any last-minute tips for him that he needs to uh, that he needs to focus on before he heads down Bray Hill? Keep it rubber side down and just uh, keep us singing. Kenny, before we head over to your lap, what bike did you choose? Obviously, you've got free reign and you've got free reign over setup, bike selection, and rider selection. What bike did you go for? I chose the pretty blue one, um, not just because it's blue, but um it's got it, it, it was a little bit lighter than the other bike so it was easier to turn um that's what i found anyways and for the rider 
I just chose the one by default. Which, which should be Ian Locker, because he's one of the only few people that can handle a, a two-stroke around there. Jamie, did you, uh, did you select yourself? Obviously, yeah. Of course I did. There's only one man for a job. All right, now it's time for the action. We're going to hand you over now to Dave Moore. First up is Kenny. We are virtually, quite literally, making TT history today. First bike away is Kenny Lamb as he tucks in behind the bubble, making his way from the grandstand towards the top of Bray Hill. This is through St Ninians. Now, how well does Kenny know this course? It's a good, solid start as he drops down Bray Hill into the dip, normally around 180 miles an hour around there, and he was certainly around that mark. So Kenny Lamb. We're about to sit up as he breaks for quarter bridge. One of the slower corners on this very fast course. You have to get a good fast exit from here. Nice and neat from Kenny Lamb. This is impressive. He, of course, setting the first time, the target, the marker for everyone else to hit. Slowing for Braddon Bridge. Takes it out wide. Perhaps a little bit too wide, but back on the power again. So it normally takes about a minute to get to Union Mills. He's just outside that, however, this is from a standing start. When Peter Hickman did that fantastic 135 mile an hour lap in 2018. Whoa! As Kenny Lamb just goes past the slower rider. But as I was saying, when Hickman was on the case in 2018 with 135 mile an hour lap, he was about a minute to Union Mills, which is normally a 10-minute drive in normal traffic. You'll have seen the name Ian Locker appear on the leaderboard there. That's because Kenny is riding Ian Locker's bike for this lap. So Kenny Lamb, part of Team Coward. His teammate Jamie Coward will be on the bike later. And together, their times will be combined to give them an overall score. So Kenny's split time heading into Glen Helen is 4 minutes and 30 seconds. And at Balaf, it was 8 minutes and 2. Picking the action back up as he heads into Ramsey. Again, just listen to the bikes as we hit Milltown. Nine minutes 40, Milltown for Peter Hickman on his 135 lap. So Kenny certainly dropping time. So back on the brakes as he comes into Parliament Square, Ramsey. Bendy bit. You can easily lose the front going into that right hand. Then up to Mayhill. Really bumpy on this section of the TT course. But not bad from Kenny Lim. We're coming up to Ramsey Hairpin. Ten minutes forty is the mark that you would want. So again, he's still that minute outside of Hickman that I keep referring to. Oh, up onto the bank. Oh, God. <laughs> Never made that pen. And that's the Isle of Man TT course. It can suck you right in. And now the glorious climb up the mountain. He has to negotiate waterworks first. I wonder if that spill's just knocked his confidence a little bit. Doesn't want to get caught out again. Oh, he's trying too oh. hard now. <laughs> gone the other way. Maybe his confidence has gone. So two spills for Kenny in less than a minute. So here we are, gooseneck. And the start of the mountain section where the road opens. The trees have disappeared generally. No more riding in tunnels, so to speak. 
least I've got through the hardest bit. So the split time at the bungalow is a very respectable 50 minutes and 20 seconds from Kenny, and at Cronknamona, 70 minutes and 41. Oh dear, oh dear, into signpost. And Kenny would have wanted to have passed him. Gets him on the brakes. Can he turn in time? He has. And another rider just up ahead now. Governor's Bridge. And the Nook to negotiate. We're looking somewhere around the 18 and a half minute mark, I think. Into ah, Governor's fell. Dip. So Kenny Lamb on the pavement. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. A few hundred yards to go. Last bit, last bit. It's going to be the first time we've seen put down, and it is 18.36. Oh, I made it. Whew. So there we have it. The first time is on the leaderboard. 18 minutes and 30. 36 seconds from Kenny with one or two crashes in there. Kenny, how do you feel your lap went? I keep forgetting about um, some of the corners in there. I got the first, I think, first four sections okay. And then from there on, it gets a bit fuzzy. And then the tricky bit with, with all the um, sharp turns, I sort of half remembered. I think I just need more hours on it. Jamie, we're going to bring you in on this one. Um, you saw that. I mean, what do you think? My uh, my advice didn't go right far, did it? <laughs> Don't crash right often, but he seemed to crash quite a lot. But like I said before, it's a <laughs> yeah. fair play for him. Uh, I can't. Uh, I've tried that view before with a behind the bubble, and it's uh, I, it's, I, I find it impossible. But to do a lap at that sort of speed or 18 minutes is, I won't be able to do. That, I don't think. Well, how's about we find out exactly how well you went, Jamie? Let's head back now to Dave Moore, who's going to take you through Jamie's lap. It's a flying lap start then for Jamie Coward. He's seen what his teammate can do. What can Jamie do? We know he can do on real terms. What can Jamie Coward do in the virtual TT powered by Motul? He's on his way. Top of Bray Hill. And the world just drops away down here into the bottom. 160 miles an hour there. Four minutes 30 was the time that Kenny Lamb set at Glen Helen, the first timing point, official timing point on the TT course. But it's a good start so far for Jamie Cowd as he hits Braddon Bridge. And certainly. That's a lot smoother and neater than his Team Coward teammate achieved on his lap. So a good start for Jamie Coward then. Jamie's split at Glen Helen was 4 minutes and 9. That's 21 seconds faster than his teammate Kenny Lamb. We pick him back up, heading onto the Cronky Voddy straight, one of the fastest parts of the course. Jamie Coward really looking the business. Had a great year last year in 2019. He's a rider that's getting better and better year upon year. Here we go, Max is out again. 162 miles an hour on Conquer Body. But it is about exit speed at the Isle of Man as well. You need good speed out of the turns onto the long straight parts. Ooh, just eases off. Oh, just eased off. Just got out of his flow slightly there for Handley's. And again, just to make sure that he stayed upright, he just had to back off on the exit. The top of the go. 
Another popular part of the course with spectators. World drops away. And the bike really bottoms out just there. We just saw the way that the road kinked down. The split at Balaf, 7 minutes and 14, and at Ramsey Hairpin, 10 minutes 34, well over a minute faster than Lamb. Into the 26th milestone, and Joey's named up. Oh! Just a little graze there from Jamie, but it doesn't slow him in any way. Fast here, but he'll have to slow for Guthrie's a really tricky section just here. It's nice here, but this part here, the right-hand turner, can draw you in harder than you want to. And now onto the section where Jamie, unfortunately, may lose a little bit of speed on his rivals. This is the Mountain Mile. Here we go. Hits 162. Normally, riders would be on the hitting 190 miles an hour. More, in fact, around 195 on this bit. But Jamie's keeping it pinned. Thirteen minutes and twenty-eight at the bungalow. Fifteen minutes forty-four at Cronknamona. Almost two minutes quicker than his teammate Lamb. So slowing for signpost corner, and it has to be said, he's kept it upright all the way. The odd moment here or there, but Jamie Coward is certainly putting down a marker for the rest of the virtual TT field to beat. Certainly carrying plenty of speed into the nook. So through Governor's Dip. Back on to Glen Crutchery Road. And it's going to be almost two minutes, I think, between him and Kenny Lamb. 18.36 for Kenny Lamb. And it is 16 minutes 37 for Jamie Coward. What a lap. Well done. So there we go. It looks like the benchmark has been set by Jamie Coward. 16 minutes and 37 seconds. Jamie, that looked like a pretty clear lap. I could only see, what, you ran wide at one turn just after Hanley's, was it? Yeah, uh, I think they were going through Hanley's. I uh, just run a bit wide there and lost a bit of time. And I knew a few places where I run a bit deep. But uh, yeah, like I said, that was my, my fastest ever time on a 600. And uh, yeah, we chuffed to bits, really. That was an amazing time. Do you think any of the riders are, are going to be able to compete with that? Or are we looking already looking at the winners of the virtual TT? I'd, li I'd like to win it. David Todd, I know he goes quite well, so I've played him a few times online. So I know that that time's fairly decent. So we'll have to just wait and see. But I think we stand a decent chance of a good result, shall we say. Kenny, Jamie might have just saved your bacon there. <laughs> I am forever grateful for that. Um, just <laughs> turning before the turn, that, that never happens with me. I just rely solely on the lines. You know, the red crosses that pops up. I'm like, oh, <laughs> now it's time to stop. <laughs> oh, it's time to go again. See, that, I guess that's where the real world experience comes in for, for someone like Jamie to, to know exactly where he is on the track and where he needs to be. All right, so the benchmark has been set with Team Coward, a combined time of 35 minutes and 13 seconds. Coming up after the break is Team Scasebrook.
Hello and welcome back to the Virtual TT powered by Motul. The first time has been set on the leaderboard and I've got to say, the next seven teams that have got to compete with Team Coward are going to have to go all out in an effort to take the top spot. The next team up is led by Rennie Skaysbrook. He's an Australian motorcycle journalist living in the US and works as a road test editor for Cycle News. In 2019, he won the prestigious Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, and 2020 would have been his debut year at the TT. Rene, first question, how gutted are you not to be attending the TT this year? Uh, yeah, it's pretty um, pretty annoying, I've got to say. Um, you know, you can, I suppose you can look at it one of many ways, really. I mean, it's the same for everybody. Um, I know there's a bunch of other guys you know, the early ones, um, you know, guys that are a lot better riders than me that uh, are missing out on their TT debut as well. So, and, you know, I was approaching the race as a bit of a different thing, being a journalist as well. But, you know, obviously trying to go there and have a bit of fun and, and not disgrace myself too much. And um, But, hey, look, we're just going to have to move everything up 12 months. <laughs> So, so has the game helped you uh, along the way in learning the course? Would you feel now comfortable if you were there that you would know which direction to go? Yes, yes, absolutely. Now that I've been to the Isle of Man and come back, like it's, it's a big step up from the first game where I would play two laps of the game and then watch uh, one of the onboard laps. When I came back and started playing the second game, I was like, oh, okay, this really makes a lot of sense now and um but yeah it's uh they're incredibly useful pieces of uh i mean they're tools um and they're they're so much better than what they were even a few years ago so Rene might not have the real world experience around the tt that some of our other tt riders have but he's got a trick up his sleeve the so-called gamer for this team is steffi now steffi is an ex-professional motocross and supercross rider steffi where are you coming to us from today I'm tuning in from the uh, United States, from Colorado. Steffi, even though you're in America, this sounds like there's a little bit of an Italian twang to your, uh, to your accent. Come stai? Yeah, tutto bene, tutto bene, grazie. Sto bene. <laughs> yes, that is correct. I'm originally from Italy. I was born in Italy and uh, started racing in Italy. And then I came into the United States to continue my professional career about when I was 21 years old. So I do have an accent, for sure. <laughs> Wow. Do you think your motocross experience is going to help you on the TT course? Well, I think so. I mean, as a, a former racer, when I picked up the game the first time, I have the instinct, you know, what you have to do on a motorcycle, of course. The, the difficult part for me was uh, to remember in the lap because uh, the, the lap on the island is so long. And, uh, you know, as a racer, that's what you rely on it, you know, over and over again when you, you practice and when you're actually doing a, a real race. But um, the laps are usually shorter, so you get to learn them fairly quickly. This one is super long and never been there in, in real life. It was like uh, hard to remember it. However, you know, like the breaking points and how to float in the lines of the where to put the motorcycle, even though it was on the video game, that, that part, I think I, I had it. <laughs> it's time for Steffi's lap. So without further ado, let's hand over now to Dave Moore with all the action. Next away, Steffi Bow, riding the Honda in the David Johnson Collars. Racing for Team Skatesbrook. So clock is ticking. Steffi is on her way. Just easing off. Down the bottom of Bray Hill. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Not the start she wanted. So Steffi off just at the bottom of Bray Hill. On her way again. A wake-up call, though. over it too much, and bang, you're off. And she needs to slow for quarter bridge. I think certainly what has just happened very much in her mind. Oh, it's too fast. Far too fast. And Steffi is leaving what could be an awful lot of work for her teammate, Rennie Skaysbrook, to do. Steffi just needs to calm down. 
Certainly the nature of the roads of the Isle of Man TT course. Certainly on this opening section as well, because there are so many long, fast, straight bits. It kind of entices you to open up and get on the throttle. You see a little bit of road ahead and think, right, OK, let's get it pinned. And that's what she was doing, but now she's learned that lesson and is just backing off as she goes into Union Mills. Already about half a minute down on Jamie Coward. One minute 58 behind Jamie Coward at Glen Helen. We pick Steffi up as she enters the tricky Kirk Michaels section 15 miles into the lap. Perhaps upon reflection, Steffi may have liked to have chosen a less powerful machine. And here we are into Ren Cullen. She might just fall for this one. No, she backs it off. Well done. Such a spectacular part, as is most of the TT course, but Ren Cullen just has that little bit something special. to Bishop's Court. This could be another 190 mile an hour section. So Bluff Bridge is coming up. That will be very interesting for Steffi because it's not fast, but you have to get it right. Like I said, the most difficult part is not knowing how the loop goes. We're on the approach then to the last bridge. You can see it up ahead. Really backs it off. And then back on the juice. Her split time at Balaf is 11 minutes and 6 seconds, 15 minutes 48 at the hairpin and 20 minutes and 16 seconds at the bungalow, 5 minutes behind Coward. And we pick her up here, heading into the finish. And just goes to show what incredible performances we've had so far from the likes of Jamie Coward and Kenny Lamb. Uh, Oops, it's pointing the wrong way, this is costing her time. Oh dear, oh dear. I think maybe the roundabout perhaps confused her. It's so tight too. So back out of Governor's Dip onto Glen Crutchery Road. Steffi Bow about to complete her lap. And her time, 25 minutes and 10 seconds. No. Oh. All right. Steffi, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I lost count how many times you crashed there. For me, the difficult part was not remembering the lap. As a former racer, you know, I just like to go fast, of course, but not knowing mm -hmm. if the corner is like a second gear or third gear, you know, like uh, I just couldn't judge it like uh, very good. So I guess I have to get myself there and do the, the loop in real life and then I will be better on the game. Uh, Rene, <laughs> what is that lap? Uh, painful. Um, <laughs> certainly <hurt. laughs> Well, I mean, considering that like she was playing as Davo Johnson as one of my best friends, I was like, oh, Davo, that hurt, mate. Sorry. <laughs> Back to the action now as we find out how Rene got on with his lap. Rennie Skaysbrook on his way and with his work cut out after that mammoth lap from teammate Steffi Bau. Rennie riding on David Johnson's Honda 600 Super Sport bike. And this is a good start so far by the looks of things. Top of Bray Hill down into the dip at the bottom over Rago's leap. And this is good. 
And so far, it looks like the riders are showing the gamers how to tackle the Isle of Man TT course. Now, can he slow in time for Quarterbridge and get it turned around? Yes, he can. Back on the power as well. Four oh nine at Glen Helen, the target for Rennie, set by Jamie Coward. Oh, this is a bit too fast into Bredon Bridge, I think. A little bit scruffy. Well, Kenny Lamb hit four minutes thirty at Glen Helen. Jamie Coward four oh nine. We're about a minute or so away from finding out where Rennie Skaysbrook will slot into on the leaderboard. Fast around Bala Crane. And he has to go something, of course, because we had an almost perfect lap from Jamie Coward. The official TT lap recorder of 135 miles an hour completed in 16 minutes 42 seconds by Peter Hickman in 2018. Jamie Coward with 16 minutes 37 in the virtual TT powered by Motul. Out of Laurel Bank. The road rushing towards us as Rennie Skaysbrook keeps the power on. So here we go then. Certainly outside 409 and outside Kenny Lamb, 4 minutes 30. So quite surprising, really. Perhaps the point of view as we go around Sarah's Cottage is making things look a little bit faster, perhaps. Eight seconds down on Team Coward's Lamb at Glen Helen and 29 seconds down on Jamie Coward. Incredibly now, he's tying with Kenny Lamb at Balath, eight minutes and two seconds, but still 29 seconds down on Coward. This is Milltown, not far then into Ramsey, and then the start of the climb up over the mountain. Next timing point coming up at Ramsey Hairpin. 10 minutes 34 that was for Jamie Coward. So Rennie Skaysbrook, as good an effort this seems, is way, way down on Coward time-wise. We have to say, he appears not to have put a foot wrong. He's just lost out, certainly in terms of top speed, to what Jamie Coward has to offer, or certainly what's on offer to Jamie Coward. Rennie Skaysbrook. Obviously going with what he's comfortable with on the 600. The fast approach into Ramsey Hairprint. But it's a nice and neat exit. So that worked very, very well. Rennie Skaysbrook was going so well, the slightest mistake, and he's paid the price. As Rene passes through Kronk Namona, he's six seconds up on Team Coward's Kenny Lamb. So it's just a blast down to the finish now as we pick up the action again with Rene at Signpost Corner. But this can catch you out through here. Into Signpost Corner he goes. Oh, he's looking good to slot into second place behind Jamie Coward. Oh, and he does a Hutchinson and goes up onto the kerb and he's off. That has cost time and has it cost him second place? Other riders come through. And with another rider just ahead, this is costing him time. Now we know that they won't win the team award. However, can he get into second place? And a Kenny Lambo, oh, it's all gone wrong. He saves it, does he? This is costing him a lot of time. Has it lost him the six seconds that he had over Kenny Lamb? Out of the dip. Back on the juice. And the time 
1836. Oh no, he's not going to do it. Kenny Lamb will stay in second place, and Rennie Scaisbrook is third fastest. 18 minutes 40. So, so you set a time of 18 minutes and 40. Steffi's was 25 minutes and 10. Uh, Rene, are you pretty happy with that time? Uh, it should have been a lot quicker, to be honest. I mean, if I hadn't had two crashes, then I would have had... I reckon if those two crashes hadn't happened, I reckon probably 18 minutes or so. Oh, sorry, 18 minutes, 20. That would have been... I would have been happy with that. Steffi, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Are you happy with your time? Absolutely not. <laughs> it is a. I was the like a eighth time that I played the game, so you know, like I'm gonna get on it. But my competitiveness, I'm in me now. They see that uh, Rani and Rani did uh, 18 minutes. I'm gonna have to beat that. <laughs> So there we have it. Two teams down, six to go. That was some of the most exciting racing I have seen around the Isle of Man TT course. Up next is Team Todd and Team Martinez. Be sure to join us because the action is going to be fast and it's going to be fierce. Thanks for watching. And that's it for tonight. Tomorrow, we'll be turning our attention to three-wheeled action as Steve Plater and myself will be joined by the Birchall brothers, John Holden, Lee Kane, and Tim Reeves. And Sundown Cinema presents Three Wheeling. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the first night of the TT lock-in fueled by Monster Energy. Make sure you join us tomorrow for more action.